to eliminate background noise. I see that we have a quorum, and I now recognize myself for opening remarks. Pursuant to the notice, we need today to hear from distinguished witnesses to examine the February 1st coup in Burma and the Burmese military's violent response to pro-democracy protesters demonstrating against the military's undoing of the election and the will of the people. The coup has resulted in an ongoing crisis in Burma that has claimed the lives of hundreds of peaceful protesters. On February 1st, Burma's military, the Kamadol, seized control of the union government, detained democratically elect elected political leaders, including its president, Win Miet, and uh, Aung Song Suu Kyi, reversing years of reform and upending Burma's fragile transition to democracy. As we often see in the face of injustice and an informal and leaderless civil disobedience movement has emerged to protest the military's power grab. Almost immediately after the coup, the Burmese people took to the streets in historic numbers to express opposition to the coup and support for democracy. The military responded with brutal force. The military has suppressed the fundamental freedoms of expression, assembly, association, and the press in an effort to silence the Burmese people's desire for democracy. But we shouldn't be surprised by these actions. We've known for years who the top Maduro are. They showed us before the Democratic opening in 2015 and again in 2017 when they led a genocide against the Rohingya people and now in 2021 with the coup and their response to popular opposition to it. The military has again turned on its citizens, responding to protests with senseless and brutal violence. Thousands have been beaten or injured. More than 750 people have been killed, and over 3,400 have been detained nationwide since the coup began. The junta's indiscriminate and lethal violence has even claimed the lives of more than 50 children, the youngest being just six years old, a girl killed in front of her father during a raid of their home in the city of Mandalay. In response to the military subversions of Burma's elected government and democratic transition, some lawmakers formed a committee representing Pudang Su Mita, or the CRPH, to restore democratically elected civilian rule. Working with leaders from the civil disobedience movement and Burma's ethnic communities, the CRPH recently formed a national unity government to represent the will of the Burmese people who have persevered through the military's brutality and finding ever more creative ways to, to resist its rule. To support the efforts of the Burmese people, the United States has already taken action to reprimand and pressure the top Maduro, and we've done this through working with partners in other like-minded countries and through the implementation of sanctions, including on the Burmese military leaders who directed the coup and on military-owned conglomerates, in addition to placing export control restrictions on Burma and freezing roughly $1 billion in assets. This very body also passed legislation to empower and protect the Burmese people, and we continue to work with partners around the world to build a more unified response to the coup. My time in Congress has taught me that nothing we do alone will ever be as effective as the coordinated action that we take alongside like-minded partners. It is critical that we at least Burma neighbors and the ASEAN and our partners and allies around the world to place additional pressure on the military junta. We must send a clear message that we stand in solidarity with the Burmese people. I look forward to hearing our witnesses speak on the ongoing crisis in Burma so that we can better understand the situation on the ground, determine what additional steps might need to be taken by the United States government to pressure the Burmese military to immediately cease its repression and violence and secure the release of all detained political leaders and activists. This is indeed a challenging time for the people of Burma who have seen far too much violence and oppression. 
Thou a regeneration of belief look to the world for hope. You must answer their call and support their campaign for dignity, democracy, and freedom. Let me now recognize my friend, the ranking member, Mr. McCall of Texas, for any remarks you might have. Okay, can you hear me now, Mr. Chairman? Now I hear you. I just had a little technical glitch, but I want to thank you for calling this uh, important hearing today and and and, um, and and staying on focus on Burma and these horrific acts and the aftermath of the latest coup. Uh, this committee has always stood with the Burmese people and their struggle to free themselves from military rule to protect their human rights and to secure democracy. I'm grateful that we continue that spirit of bipartisanship by passing multiple pieces of legislation already this year. And I look forward to taking more action to hold the Burmese military accountable, uh, not as Republicans or Democrats, but as Americans conducting a foreign policy consistent with our values. Uh, just a, a few months ago, uh, the people of Burma had a flawed but functioning democracy. Today, they live under a reign of terror with their democratic freedoms being stolen away. And since this latest coup on February 1st, we've seen what can only be described as a military committing mass murder against its own people it's supposed to protect. The latest estimates place a death toll at well over 700 civilians killed throughout Burma. In addition to this violence, the Burmese people are suffering through mass arrests, nighttime raids, communication blackouts, and widespread intimidation of the press. That's all designed to crush their spirits and their will to resist. Uh, incredibly, it's not working. The people of Burma continue to take to the streets, inspiring the world with their resolve to regain the democracy and their military, uh, that their military stole. The United States will continue to stand with them, and today's hearing will guide our next steps. To begin, we need to tighten our sanctions against the regime, against the military for their brutal human rights violations during this coup, as well as their prior genocide against the Rohingya. In addition, if we want to achieve any meaningful purpose at the United Nations, we need to understand the motivations of Russia, which is drawing closer to the Burmese military. And we need to understand the motivations of the Chinese Communist Party, which wants to extend its Belt and Road at Mishir through Burma to the Indian Ocean. And most of all, we need to make sure we are doing all we can for the brave people of Burma who are risking their lives to stand up for their rights. People like in Burma's, uh, like Burma's ambassador to the United Nations who has spoken out against the regime that has taken over his country's government is at a huge risk to himself uh, and his family. So Mr. Ambassador, it's quite an honor to have you with us here today. And your bravery inspires us all. I'd like to thank Ambassador Curry and, and Ms. Omar for joining us today to discuss our next steps to respond to this horrible coup. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Gentlemen, yield back. And I'd now like to turn to the Mr. Barrow, the chair of the Asia Subcommittee. I yield one minute to you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and to the ranking member for holding this um, incredibly important hearing. I'll keep my comments short. Um, I'm proud of the work that we've done in a bipartisan way, both on the subcommittee as well as the full committee and in, in a bicameral way, as well as the steps that the Biden administration has taken both to implement sanctions on the, the military, but also to show support for the Burmese people. And now that this coup has gone from days to, to weeks to months, the resolve of the Burmese people is something to be admired. You know, uh, up to 90% of the country is on a general strike, shutting things down, sending a clear message that the Burmese people don't want to um, backslide on this coup. Everything we can do as a committee and as a country and internationally to support the Burmese people and their rights and their freedoms is um, something that we ought to be doing. So again, thank you for hosting this hearing. The message to the Burmese people is the American people and the American Congress are with you. Thank you and I'll yield back. Thank you, the gentleman back. I now yield one minute to the ranking member, Mr. Chavez, for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As the current ranking member of the Asia and Pacific Subcommittee, 
And having chaired uh, that committee uh, several Congresses back, I followed events in Burma uh, very closely for quite a few years now. And the February 1st coup was a shameless assault on Burma's fledgling democracy that once again demonstrated to the world who really runs that country, and that's the Tatmadaw, the military. Uh, this time around, though, the people of Burma have courageously rejected the coup and are demanding their God-given right to freedom and self-government uh, as they continue to face barbaric uh, suppression by the military. And the situation keeps getting darker as the Tatmadaw arrests, tortures, uh, murders, more innocent people every day. In light of this, the Biden administration must rally international support for a tougher response against the Tatmadaw. We need a concerted response uh, that would bring this coup to an end and place Burma on a permanent path to a stable federal uh, democracy. Thank you for holding this uh, hearing, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chabot. Now I'll introduce our witnesses. Ambassador Chow Mitchell began serving as the permanent representative of Myanmar to the United Nations in October 2020. Since joining the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in 1993, she has held a number of diplomatic posts, including Myanmar's permanent representative to the United Nations in Geneva, permanent representative to the World Trade Organization, permanent representative to the Organization of the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons in The Hague, as well as Myanmar's ambassador to Switzerland. Ms. Chen Omar is a Burmese human rights and democracy activist and currently serves as the chairperson of the advisory board of Progressive Voice. She was involved in organizing the historical general strike on August the 8th, 1988, following the Burmese military crackdown on demonstrators. She was forced to leave her home and was granted political refuge in the United States. She has continued to campaign for democracy in Burma internationally and regionally as the founder of a number of civil society organizations, including Women's League of Burma, Burma Partnership, and Progressive Voice. Ambassador Kelly Curley serves as the U.S. Ambassador at Large for Global Women Issues and the U.S. Representative at the United Nations Commission on the Status of Women. Prior to her appointment, she led the Department of State's Office of Global Criminal Justice and served as the United States Representative to the UN Economic and Social Council, an alternative representative to the UN General Assembly from 2017 to 2018. Throughout her career in foreign policy, Ambassador Curry has specialized in human rights, political reform, development, and humanitarian issues with a focus on the Asia-Pacific region. So without objection, all the witnesses prepared testimony will be made part of the record. And I now recognize the witnesses for five minutes each to summarize their testimony. We'll start with Ambassador Shaw Mochum. You're now recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, ranking member, members of the committee. Good afternoon, Munglawa. I thank you all for holding this important hearing on the serious situation of my country. And thanks uh, for all the strong, uh, encouraging remarks. Due to time constraints, I will be delivering the shorter version of my statement, and the full version has been submitted to the esteemed committee. I will focus more on what action the United States should take. Mr. Chair, the situation in Myanmar is indeed an unfolding tragedy that continues to escalate over time. The people of Myanmar are seriously suffering from the military brutality and inhumane act day and night. Fear tends to be the order of the day, and we all are living under fear. A free and fair general elections were successfully held on 8 November 2020, which is a significant milestone in our history. The NLD won the landslide victory at the election. To the ignorance of the people desire, the military staged a coup on 1st February and unlawfully detained the state councillor, the president, other leaders, and the parliamentarians, as well as civil activists. 
in wake of the military coup, millions of people came out on the streets to protest against the military. Subsequently, the military terrorist group has cracked down the peaceful protests in a brutal and inhumane manner and committed serious human rights violations, including ultra killing, arbitrary arrests, and torture. More than 750 civilians have already been murdered by the military. Majority of victims are young people who are the future of the country. They even kill children as young as six years old. The people of Myanmar are resilient and uh, unprecedentedly united in fighting against the military, in calling for release of all unlawful detainees, for return of the state power to the people, and for restoration of democracy, and for building a federal democratic union. The three pillars, namely the peaceful protest, CDM, and CRPH are working hand in hand in this regard. Federal Democracy Charter was announced on 31st March with the ultimate goal of drafting a new federal constitution. The charter outlines an eight-step political roadmap towards building a new federal democratic union of Myanmar. Accordingly, NUG was formed by the CRPH. The formation of the NUG was overwhelmingly welcomed by the people of Myanmar. In line with the people's will, the international community's recognition and engagement with the NUG is a critical step to take, and it could pave the way to end the violence, to save lives of innocent civilians, and protect them from the military brutal and inhumane act, to restore democracy in Myanmar, and provide humanitarian assistance to the people in need. Mr. Chair, I wish to stress that Myanmar is not just witnessing another major setback to democracy, but also the crisis is threatening the regional peace and security. In line with the principle that a state has the responsibility to protect its own people from crimes against humanity, the NUG, together with the people, have taken all possible ways and means to defend our own people from the military's inhumane and brutal acts. We urge the international community to adhere to the principle and to take the responsibility to protect the people of Myanmar from the possible crimes against humanity committed by the military terrorist group. Taking this opportunity on, on behalf of the NUG and the people of Myanmar, I would like to thank the United States for your continued support. However, we need the United States to take a decisive leadership role in helping resolve the Myanmar crisis. On behalf of the NUG and people of Myanmar, I wish to appeal to you and the House of Representatives as follows. To save lives of innocent civilians, protection should be immediately extended to the people of Myanmar. Humanitarian assistance should be urgently provided to the people in need. Ne necessary shelters should be provided to those seeking refuge in neighboring countries and elsewhere. No fly zone should be declared in relevant areas in Myanmar. Global arms embargo should be imposed immediately. Targeted, coordinated, and TEFAR sanctions should be applying against the military. Nyawari Bank, Inwa Bank, MFDB, and MOGE should be immediately added in the target extension list. Bank accounts associated with the military and their members should be frozen, and financial inflow into the military regime and its associates should be cut off immediately. Foreign direct investment should be suspended, and UG should be recognized as a legitimate government any visa should not be issued to any diplomats appointed by State Administrative Council. And UG should be allowed to use the Myanmar funds put in freeze in the U.S. for benefit of the people of Myanmar. In, in conclusion, Mr. Chair, uh, we are confident that ending the murderous military regime will pave a way to finding sustainable solutions to the challenges we face related to effective protection and promotions of rights of ethnic religious, and all other minority, and equality for all. The people of Myanmar are resolute to achieve these goals. Time is of the essence for the people of Myanmar who feel helpless. As such, the United States and the international communities must act now decisively in a collective, concrete, and timely manner to avoid further killing of innocent civilians and further bloodshed in Myanmar. Please do not let killing continue. Please act now. We will always 
remember the help and support of the United States. And thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. I now recognize Ms. Ken Omar for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, distinguished committee members, thank you for inviting me to speak to you on the tragic events and hold, unfolding in my home country, Burma, and for holding today's hearing. I'd like to thank the United States government for your ongoing support to realize our long fought aspiration for a federal democracy. The following is a summary of my full statement. I'm here to share the realities on the ground, the untold suffering of the people, and appeal for swift action against the brutal Burmese military junta. I appeal to you as a survivor of 1988's brutal coup, led by the same military responsible for today's coup, and as someone who still yearns for a true federal democracy in her homeland. In 1995, I testified before the U.S. Senate detailing the fatal crackdowns in 1988. I come before you today, nearly 30 years later, certain to describe yet another dark and devastating chapter in Burma's history. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, since February 1st, millions of people from all walks of life across Burma, including police and soldiers, have come together to reject the military's unlawful coup attempt. The civil disobedience movement has effectively prevented the military from controlling the administration of government, banks, hospitals, and other sectors. We can thus say that the attempted coup is failing. In response, the Honda has launched a nationwide campaign of terror attempting to force people into submission using any means necessary. Peaceful protests have been met with murderous and indiscriminate violence, including execution-style killings and the use of heavy military weaponry. The deadliest single day of bloodshed occurred on March 27, with the mass murder of 169 unarmed civilians. Every day, the violence and death continue. At least 766 people have been killed and over 4,600 arbitrarily arrested. All of this is conducted with complete impunity. The hunter has also enacted new laws to criminalize protesters, including sentencing 19 protesters to death. They are also deliberately destroying the evidence of their crimes, such as by removing bullets from those they have killed before stitching them back together. Often, cash is demanded from the victim's family in exchange for the bodies to be returned. And they're not just taking lives. They are destroying houses, private property, and food stores at random, and robbing people of their cell phones, computers, and motorcycles. Torture and beatings in detention are commonplace, with no access to legal representation or contact with families. For women and LGBTIQ, the situation is far worse, with reports of rape, sexual violence, and psychological abuse. Sexual and gender-based violence has long been used by the Burma military as a weapon of war against ethnic nationalities to terrorize them into submission. They have murdered at least 51 children, including those in their homes and playing in the streets. Abduction and torture of family members, including children as young as two, are increasing. Since the end of March, they've launched airstrikes in Karen and Katim states. In the last week of April alone, there were 68 airstrikes. This has led to the displacement of over 45,000 people and killing of at least 20. Furthermore, people are fleeing into ethnic areas, exacerbating a, a humanitarian crisis that was already teetering towards catastrophe before the coup. The UN warns of a slow burning food crisis. Severe restrictions on freedom of movement and information being imposed including nationwide internet cuts and declaration of martial law in some townships, sending Burma back into darkness. Mr. Chairman, in spite of such brute force and violence, the people of Burma continue with the, their daily protest. Standing firm in their defiance against this illegitimate military junta and in their support, for, in their support of their legitimate government, the National Unity Government. They ask for the international community, including this legislative body, to do all they can to recognize and support the NUT. I appeal to this Congress and the Biden administration to stop the flow of oil and gas revenues from Chevron to this unlawful military hunter. 
imposed a comprehensive embargo on the transfer or sale of military arms and equipment, including dual use goods, continue to impose and enforce targeted sanctions aimed at the military and their business interest, and support efforts to hold the military to account under international law for their atrocity crimes, including for the, Ren the, Ro for the Rohingya genocide in 2017. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to once again thank you and the members of the committee for allowing me to testify today. I'll close my statement with this. Today's violence and atrocities are only possible because of a lack of accountability for the past crimes. There can be no democratic and peaceful Burma unless this military is held to account and placed under total civilian control. I've spent the past 32 years trying to bring about democratic change in Burma. I'll continue to fight for the people. But drawing on my decades of experience, I know that the people of Burma need concrete actions from you and the broader international community. There's this unprecedented window of opportunity that the people of Burma, so many of them young, have created by sacrificing their lives to topple this military hunter once and for all. We must not allow it to slip through our fingers. I look forward to your concrete and swift action and answering your questions today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Kamal. I now recognize Ambassador Terry for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Meeks, Ranking Member McCall, and the rest of the committee for the opportunity to appear before you today with my distinguished co-panelists. In the midst of all the devastation and cruelty that you've heard about um, from the previous speakers, Burma's Spring Revolution has actually been characterized by this incredible optimism, creativity, public, spirited, public spiritedness, and this amazing inclusiveness that's largely been lacking in previous movements. And it's this, um, this, this dynamic that I wanna speak to a little bit today, because the way that the CDM and protest movements have cut across class, geographic, ethnic, religious, and generational distinctions in unprecedented ways gives me a lot of hope for where things are actually headed if we can break the circuit on violence that's currently accelerating across the country. The ethnic nationalities and women who have played increasingly critical and, and leadership roles in this movement have opened up long suppressed dialogues on key societal issues. At the same time, they're fighting a military junta. This is really unprecedented. And it's this increased awareness of and empathy for the situation of the ethnic people among the majority Bama protesters that's one of the most important features of what is happening today. And one that I think we need to look at as a critical element going forward as we analyze our own policy prescriptions. You've heard from my colleagues about the unprecedented combination of persistent nationwide protests and non-participation through the civil disobedience movement and how this has tested the junta's ability to retain effective control of the country. And I think this is also important, especially as we look at the, what the young people are doing, how their savvy um, digital native kind of behavior has allowed the whole movement to stay a half step ahead of the junta as they cut off internet access and tried to censor content. Um, instead, these groups have been able to keep the content flowing into the global and regional media. And they've been really connected with um, regional activists and in, in, into the Milk Tea Alliance and have created this, have been part of this very creative regional network that is another thing that we can build on with our own policy approaches. As we pass the three month mark though, I think that we are seeing the, the conflict starting to morph into a new phase and we need to be very conscious of this. In recent weeks, we, as my colleagues mentioned, we've seen this um, effort by the democratic and ethnic nationality forces to come together to disavow the military drafted 2008 constitution, to issue a new federal democratic charter, to appoint a new national inter unity government that is among the most diverse um, cabinet in the country's history. Um, there's also a lot of anecdotal evidence, however, that young people are giving up on nonviolence 
struggle and are joining up with the ethnic armed organizations with the intent to form the basis of a new federal army to um, support the national unity government. And the national unity government itself has been very open about its intentions there um, and, and, and what they want to do. The Tatmadaw has, of course, responded with more violence. And so we see this increasingly likely scenario of balkanization and state failure, especially when you understand that there are so many well-armed um, groups uh, in the country and that, that have never operated under effective state control. And this is a really critical element, again, as we think about what U.S. policy should be going forward and how we should respond. Um, we've, we've seen that the international community, instead of reacting appropriately to the situation, has delegated the international response to one of the weakest regional organizations in the world, the Association of Southeast Asian States, ASEAN, and left to its own devices, we saw what happened with that, where the five-point consensus that came out of a special summit in Jakarta recently has utterly failed. The junta had disavowed it and violated it before men online even returned back to Burma from Jakarta. And the United Nations has been no better, frankly. The Security Council has absolutely failed in its responsibilities to support international, to protect and promote international peace and security. Um, as the pen holder on Burma, the United, Na the United Kingdom has been reluctant to table a resolution, reportedly out of fear of joint Chinese and Russian vetoes. And frustration with the council on the ground is growing as well as within the ranks of the UN who are looking at alternatives to the Security Council. So I think that there are a number of things that in my last minute here that um, we can highlight, and I'm happy to go into more detail on, on in the Q&A about where the U.S. can and should encourage its allies to take action around three key issues. One is around recognition and legitimacy and things that we can do relatively low cost to support the national unity government. Um, cutting off the Hunter's money supply, which you've heard from my colleagues about a little bit, and then moving on a security council, um, which would also include accountability issues. So again, I'm happy to talk about more of those things during the Q&A and get into some of the details. They're also found in my written testimony, which has been submitted to the committee. Thank you again for the opportunity. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, and thank you all for your testimony of today, a very enlightening. I now recognize members for five minutes each pursuant to the House rules. And all time is yielded for the purpose of questioning our witnesses. I'll recognize members by committee seniority, alternating between Democrats and Republicans. If you miss your turn, please let our staff know and we will come back to you. If you seek recognition, you must unmute your microphone and address the chair verbally and identify yourself so that we know who is speaking. I will start by recognizing myself for five minutes. Let me start with uh, Ambassador Cho Min Chun. Uh, again, thank you for appearing before us today and for your bravery in speaking out against the coup. And I'd like to ask you about the national unity government and how representative is it for the vast diversity of your country. Um, there has been, a, you know, I know a long simmering civil war in Burma, and there are many ethnic groups there that are not just antagonistic towards the military, but also dissatisfied with the lack of progress in the peace process under the NLD. So how is the national unity government working to engage to reassure those ethnic groups? That's my first question. And secondly, then what vision does the CRPH and the national unity government have for the ethnic unity in Burma? Mr. Ambassador, I believe you're on mute. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for the questions. Uh, yeah, as as I, uh, Ambassador Kelly also rightly pointed out, the, you know, the, the, the NUG, how diverse it is, and the, you know, the composition it has is, you know, it is very unprecedented. It's uh, the composed of, you know, quite uh, the members from the different Ethnic, uh, ethnic, uh, uh, ethnic groups, including the ethnic and organization. So it's a quite di diverse. It's also, it includes quite a number of women. 
in, 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 in the government. So, so th th that is what we see is very encouraging. So this kind of, you know, the, uh, the NUG, it's, you know, uh, come up with the, co uh, the, the close consultation among the all uh, uh, relevant stakeholders. So that, that is what we see is, so it is very encouraging for us. I mean, the people of Myanmar, where how the energy come out and how it will proceed uh, with the, you know, the goal of uh, building a, a federal democratic uh, union. That, that is, you know, the, the people uh, uh, all over the country give the over one support to the NUG because of the, you know, the, it's, it's, uh, it's credibility and it's because of the, the support from the people. So, and the NUG and CRPH, you know, as the, as you know, the CRPH is, you know, it's a, uh, it stand like a, now the legislative body. Uh, body. So, so, so the NUG as an executive body and the CRPH as a legislative body. So we are working uh, uh, hand in hand, uh, NUG and the CRPH working hand in hand. So because what we are doing is that we trying to control the area as much as possible together with ethnic M organization. You may notice that lately uh, there are the you know fight uh, between the uh, the the ethnic M's organization and the uh, the 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 military uh, the terrorist group. So because the ethnic M organizations are now stand with the people of Myanmar providing all the support to the people and the people also supporting the AMS organization. Now, as uh, Ambassador Kelly also mentioned that uh, the, uh, the, the young people who joined the protest now are taking some trainings under the SM, uh, ethnic AM, uh, area controlled by the ethnic AM organization. So for us, we don't want to go that much farther, but it's a bit because of the, you know, we need to fight against the military. We still need to have the support from the international community, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Ambassador. Let me ask Ambassador Curry real quick uh, to follow up on that and also what do you think the ASEAN should be doing? What more should they be doing than they not doing right now? Um, well, I think that the national unity government is doing a good job of reaching out to ethnic nationalities. The biggest challenge right now, though, is that they continue to struggle on um, dealing with the kind of birth defects of Burma's um, independence. And it's a very complicated dynamic around who has status as a recognized ethnic nationality. And it gets into a lot of very difficult issues. This is where the Rohingya, for instance, fall into a gap and have been able to, and have been subject to deep discrimination as a result. Um, with regard to ASEAN, they are very poorly um, set up to deal with political problems like this. The best thing they could do, frankly, would be to ask the Security Council to take responsibility for the problem and hand it over to them instead of being an obstacle and a fig leaf that allows for Security Council inaction, in my opinion. Thank you. My time has expired. I'm going to, you know, we try to stick to get as many members as we can to hold all members to the five minute rule. I now uh, acknowledge Ranking Member McCall uh, for five minutes for questions. I have to unmute, Mr. McCall. Office, can we unmute Mr. McCall? Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, the next member is Mr. Shabbat. Uh, Mr. McCall had to drop off for a moment. Very good. Mr. Shabbat, you're now recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much. Um, I'll start with uh, Ambassador uh, uh, Curry, if I, if I could. Um, Ambassador, you mentioned that uh, the UN uh, has basically totally failed in its effort. And my thinking when you mentioned that was so, what else is new? Um, but uh, since February, uh, Beijing and Moscow have blocked international uh, efforts to restore stability in, in Burma, including 
uh, blocking UN Security Council statement condemning uh, the coup before eventually agreeing to a more limited uh, statement uh, that did not use the word uh, coup. Uh, how, how can uh, the U.S. work with other nations uh, on the Security Council, including India and Vietnam, for example, uh, to coax uh, China and Russia into being uh, more helpful, although, as we know, uh, that experience can be about as frustrating as anything uh, on this globe, trying to get them to cooperate constructively on virtually anything. But uh, I'd love to hear what you have to say, Madam Ambassador. Thank you, Mr. Shabbat, and thank you for your historic leadership on Burma. It's deeply appreciated. Um, I, in my experience working in the Security Council, China hates to be isolated. Um, Russia doesn't. Russia is more tolerant of it and a little bit more risk tolerant and more of a chaos agent. But the Chinese have a lot of vested interests on the ground in Burma. And I think that to say that they've been blocking something is a little bit of a mischaracterization. The UK and the US and the other so-called like-minded countries haven't really tried to drag things out into the open and force the issue in a way that would force the Chinese to make choices that they currently are avoiding making and are very happy to avoid making. I believe that the best way to see progress in the UN is to actually force the issue and to, to, to start talking about tabling a resolution that to actually accomplish some of the things, whether it's an arms embargo or a no-fly zone that the Burmese have asked for, to have open meetings instead of closed ones where the Chinese and others can hide behind the process. But the more openness there is, the more I think the, the like-minded countries can benefit and pressure the Chinese into being less obstructive. Okay, thank you very much. And just to follow up, if I could, could you uh, maybe expound a little bit upon what China is up to in, in Burma? What are their interests there? What are they doing behind the scenes? Um, you know, what, if anything, can the United States do to obviously promote uh, regional stability and democracy and, you know, push back on their uh, malevolent uh, uh, you know, desires, uh, not only, especially there, but really throughout the region. Could you kind of discuss what China is really up to? I think that on Burma, the Chinese have built up a lot of um, infrastructure, so they have sunk costs in Burma. They don't love dealing with the military there. They find them an unreliable partner, but and they had invested a lot in working with the democratically elected government of Aung San Suu Kyi, and so they were quite comfortable having her imprimatur on their big economic um, Belt and Road, China-Myanmar economic um, cooper cooperation engagements in Burma, and were willing to deal with a democratic government quite fine, found it very comfortable for them. So there's no reason they can't do that again. The problem is that they don't, um, they continue to hide behind this non-interference posture, which is part of a broader global issue. Um, and so there is that. I think that if they were forced to choose that they would, um, it, it would improve the odds that they at least would, would have to make a choice toward the democratically elected government and move in that direction and show some favoritism. But they're not going to do it absent others who are more naturally inclined toward doing that and unless they feel boxed out. And so I think that that's the key for us. I think that cuts across everything in Southeast Asia, that we've got to stand on the side of democracy and human rights and these values in order to highlight the difference between what we offer the region and the model that the Chinese are offering them, which is very extractive, very narrowly self-interested. Um, one example where we could do this, for instance, is if we were to work with the national unity government to help get vaccines cross-border through trusted NGOs that have experience while China is giving vaccines to the junta and contrast that, for instance. Well, thank you very much. My time's expired, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. I now recognize Mr. Sherman of California for five minutes. Well, thank you. I want to point out that uh, Congress provided about $135 million of assistance to Burma. The USAID and state have redirected $42 uh, million. Uh, I can see a use for our money in supporting anti-government democracy activists 
uh, press, et cetera. Uh, but the USAID seems to be bent on spending money on general economic development, which while it might be good for people in Burma, it is also good for the junta. And we shouldn't evaluate whether these programs are good. Um, some of them help people in need, but whether they're the best use for American uh, foreign aid dollars, which could instead go to help India deal with COVID-19, allow us to do even more, and we're doing a lot, to do more for the Rohingya refugees uh, or support uh, political engagement uh, and uh, uh, in Nigeria or election observation in Benin or a host of other issues uh, that would be a better use in strengthening the economy of a country that is right now run by the junta. I want to focus on the Rohingya. Um, and uh, last month, the, uh, uh, we saw the formation of this national unity government, which has said it will uh, deliver justice for our Rohingya brothers and sisters. But it's a council of 27 people, none of whom are Rohingya. Um, and so I know uh, uh, Your Excellency Mr. Tun is, uh, is not officially part of the National Unity Government, but I want to give him an opportunity. Should they uh, add a 28th member to the council to represent the Rohingya community? And is it important for this National Unity Government to declare that they will give citizenship documents to all Rohingya who were born in Burma or in the refugee camps? Okay. Uh, thank you, thank you, Mr. Uh, 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 and Mr. Sherman, for the questions. So you know the uh, NUG government and the CRPH make it very clear that you know now the common enemy of us is the military. So when we end the you know the this murderous military regime, as I mentioned in my 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 uh, my introductory remarks. Uh, it's, uh, it's clear that you know we we when it's ending this kind of you know military regime, we are in the a better position uh, to promote and to protect uh, the, uh, uh, the 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 Sir, rights of the. If I can interrupt, I think there's no doubt that uh, the uh, national unity government is better than the junta, but that's a very very low standard. Will this government provide citizenship documents? Do you want to urge them to provide citizenship documents to all Rohingya born in Burma or in the refugee camp? Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, the, the point that you, you raised, of course, you know, the as a, as a, uh, uh, a government, uh, we were, of course, we will be, you know, uh, uh, in, in, in line with the, you know, the existing law. But those existing law may not be, you know, the and the standard. So we are of the view that, that you know, those the law that, for example, the 1982 citizenship law uh, need to be uh, amended. That is what is clear. And then the those who are in line with you know existing law, of course, they will be sir. In, existing law deprived them of citizenship and set them up for murder before the coup. The government that appointed you committed genocide against the Rohingya. Can you call upon the National Unity Government to provide citizenship documents to those born in your country, including the Rohingya? Yeah, it's uh, of course. You know, we are very clear that you know the those who ever are born in Myanmar and then those who are entitled, they have to be. You know, according to the- Under, uh, under the law that existed, they're not entitled. There are laws that existed for decades saying that people whose grandparents were born in Burma are denied citizenship. And for you to say, we're gonna carry out existing law would be like a, a post Nazi government saying, we're gonna carry out existing German law. Uh, no, no, I, I see it differently, sir, uh, because, you know, there are the same difficulty that, you know, the previous NLD government had. So if we go according with, you know, uh, strictly according with the you know, law, there are, there are a lot, a lot of Rohingya are entitled to become a citizen. Very clear. That is, you know, My time is expired. 
Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. I now recognize Mr. Wilson uh, from South Carolina, who is the chair, the ranking member of the subcommittee of the uh, Middle East, North Africa, and Global Cause of Terrorism for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for calling this important hearing. And we appreciate so much the witnesses who are appearing here today on behalf of the uh, freedom and liberty of the people of Burma. Uh, I would actually grew up with an appreciation of the people of the region and that my father served in the Flying Tigers, China, Burma, India. And uh, we know that uh, the United States had such a positive role in liberating and keeping free the people of the region. Uh, with this in mind, uh, with Ambassador Curry, uh, the United Nations estimates that approximately 20,000 people have fled their homes and remain displaced within Burma, while almost 10,000 have fled to neighboring countries. How does the current crisis in Burma inundate the already stretched thin resources available in the region that are being used to assist Rohingya refugees? Thank you for that question because it is very important. Most of those people are fleeing either internally up north and east away from the area affected by the Rohingya crisis more toward Thailand and China. And so the, the population movements have been in different directions. In the past, the United States and other donors operated very robust cross-border assistance, humanitarian assistance into some of these areas. But most of those um, channels have been allowed to atrophy over the past decade as we moved more humanitarian assistance through channels um, through the, the government of Burma. Now we need to really look at widening and reopening and, and reinvigorating a lot of those cross-border channels in order to reach those populations who cannot be reached through humanitarian assistance, which has been access to those areas has been cut by the junta as part of their, their um, attacks on these, these areas and on the civilians living within them, sir. Well, thank you very much for your insight. And uh, Representative Tung, how incredible your courage uh, to speak out on behalf of the people of uh, your home country. And uh, with that in mind, U.S. trade with Burma is limited, and therefore the United States has little financial leverage over the military. What can the United States do to encourage countries in the region to put real financial pressure on Burma to isolate the military and to restrict foreign financial flows benefiting the military junta? Thank, thank you, thank you, Mr. Wilson. Uh, I think uh, because the the role of United States is very important influencing the you know, regional uh, countries because the many uh, bank accounts and the financial flows coming through the uh, countries in the region. So I think it's very, very, uh, very, very important that if you put the you know, sanction on the you know, some additional. Uh, uh, entities like the uh, the the MFTB, MOGE, and the uh, the Myawadi Bank, Ingwa Bank, so that you know the financial flow will be you know the cut off, and that this will make a lot of a lot of pressure on the military. So what we want is that we want the military to back to the uh, the table to discuss to 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 restore the democracy in in in, in Myanmar. That is you know the United States can play a very influential role to put pressure on the military. And again, thank you for your personal courage. And a final question, again, for Representative Time. Although China has strong incentives to avoid chaos in the region, uh, it sadly also views the country as a battleground for preventing the encroachment of democratic values and Western interests in its backyard. How can the United States engage with civil society leaders uh, in Burma, Myanmar, to fortify the democratic values and institutions of the country. Yeah, what what I see is that please continue support the you know the, uh, the all the uh, that you continue support to the you know the civil society as well as you know I, if I may please support the NUG uh, uh, national unity government and recognize them. So that's the way we can put a lot of pressure not only to the military but also to the China. So that you know, China where come to uh, come to you know engage with the N NUG. So that is very important that you know please continue support to the C uh, CSOs as well as the N national unity government. All stakeholders who are fighting for the democracy 
please do support us. Thank you. Well, hey, your insight and courage, again, uh, is so inspiring. Uh, and I just appreciate the efforts of Chairman Meeks to bring this to the attention of the world. I yield back. Chairman yields back. I now recognize Representative Jerry Connolly of Virginia, who's the chief of the NATO Parliamentary Assembly for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for your leadership on this critical issue and insisting that the U.S. Congress uh, bring attention to what is happening in Myanmar. And I thank you for your leadership. Uh, and I echo Joe Wilson, Congressman Joe Wilson, on that it's vital that we elevate this issue in the Congress because we can save lives. I have two questions I want to put to the whole panel, and I'll start with you, uh, Ambassador Curry, if you don't mind. Uh, one is, when we think back about the U.S. sort of loosening up uh, its restrictions, travel restrictions, sanctions, and the like, starting around 2012, are there things in retrospect we could have, should have insisted on that might have prevented or mitigated the coup that happened nine years later? And secondly, what role will the military have to play, if any, in a government post-coup that presumably favors the pro-democratic forces? But, I mean, the, the military, Canada is there, whether we like it or not. And what role are they going to insist on and what role should we accept? And, and if I could put that question to all three of you and start with you, Madam Ambassador. Uh, thank you, sir. With regard to 2012, um, we should not have lifted sanctions on the military-owned enterprises at that time and should have been more clear that those were not going to be lifted until and unless the military moved forward with more reforms to the Constitution that addressed issues of civilian control of the military and began a glide path towards removing the military from political institutions. I don't think anybody in the in the Democratic forces, at least not prior to February, would have advocated for the dissolution of the Katmada, but that it should be under democratic um, control, under democratic civilian control in a democracy is kind of a sine qua non, and it never happened. And that was a mistake for the international community not to insist that that be part of the package. Um, on the, on the, and so I think that that also gets to the role that the Tatmadaw should play in a democratic um, federal union is that it needs to be reformed. It needs to be heavily reformed, including by changing its force posture, its makeup, its structure, and most critically, putting it under legitimate and seriously strong civilian controls. Over. Yeah, because, because it's, it's culturally, isn't it? You're creating a culture that's entirely separate from the rest of the country. What could go wrong with that? Thank you. Mr. Ambassador, those two questions. And then Ken Omar. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Connolly. Uh, I think it is very important that, you know, the, our aim is to end the military regime. Uh, need, the military should not be in politics, should not be in economy no longer. That's the way we can bring them, uh, the, you know, military under the civilian government. Otherwise, you know, it's where, you know, this vicious uh, cycle we were faced, you know, again and again. So this is the time that we have to uh, do, make it or not. You know, we have to do or die. This is the time that we have to do it. So with, within the country, we have the full strength, but at the same time, we need help from the international community, especially like the country, like United States. We need a lot of help from you. Please put, uh, continue put pressure on the military, whatever way that we can. That is, that, that is the, our top priority now is saving lives of innocent civilians. And then also yes. the providing humanitarian system at this point. And then once the Federal, federal Democratic Union formed and the Federal Army were established, then the military has to be under the civilian government. That is what Thank I'm you. Saying. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador, and I want to give Ms. Uh, Omar a chance to respond as well. Thank you, Congressman Connolly. Um, to respond to your question on the, uh, like whether the, the, you know, the restrictions, I mean, sorry, the sanctions uh, in 2012, whether it was uh, uh, in, your, your, in responding to your question, I want to recall my, uh, my uh, conversations and meetings with the uh, officers from the State Department that time that I was actually appealing to the State Department 
uh, not to let go of all of these uh, measures because we know uh, so well of how this military mindset is. And uh, we, don't, we don't have the confidence enough in that. Yes, of course, there was a, uh, there were a, a cautious optimism, but also we know that we cannot be confident enough yet. So I was actually uh, appealing to the, the State Department to have the plan B and also go through step-by-step -step calculations of lifting of you know, like, uh, the measures, depending on what are we getting from this, you know, like uh, 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 the, the military uh, uh, guided, uh, quote unquote, civil, uh, uh, um, the um, disciplined democracy. So I think Right. Of course, the military will be there, but I think we need to ensure that they must they go back to the barracks and the civilian control. But also, most importantly, we need to address the transition of justice. Without the justice and healing, we will not be able to have a, a, a way to move forward. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. General time has expired. I now recognize Representative Scott Perry of Pennsylvania for five minutes. Hey, thanks, Mr. Chairman. I don't know how my there, but good to see everybody. Uh, Ambassador Curry, you know, I, I got to tell you, I look at this situation in Burma, and I'm not sure what the best position for the United States to be. I mean, obviously, we don't support the junta or the coup, but Xi Xi, of course, you know, was no friend of the Rohingyas, and you know, most of us in this committee, if not all of us, voted to uh, characterize that as a genocide uh, against the Rohingya. I don't know if the administration has taken that up yet or, can, or, or plans to, but um, it doesn't seem like a great outcome. I mean, the Chinese military, I think, is probably sending arms to the, uh, to the military right there to oppress the people. And um, e even if it were to work out with Xi Xi, it would work out for the Rohingya. So maybe my question, first of all, my question would be, um, at a minimum, wh why wouldn't we sanction the state-owned uh, oil energy company there i think it's moe or something like that and then and then next would be what can the united states do unilaterally um unilaterally to uh to advance our efforts in burma vis-a-vis -vis china how about how about those two questions so i but i do agree that we should have um already put sanctions on the Myanmar oil and gas enterprise moge that is the main recipient of royalties and funds related to the oil and gas extractive industries in Burma. And I hope that the administration will do that soon together with other countries um, and, and put pressure on the multinational um, oil and gas industry partners that are continuing to pay royalties to the junta to put those funds into escrow accounts and keep them from going into the hands of the junta. Um, yes, China and Russia, of course, are selling weapons and providing some political support to the military junta, but um, the Chinese, above all, want stability in Burma and want an environment where they can do business and a permissive business environment for them. That is not what they have right now. So this has not exactly worked out well for them. I believe that there is a path where we, we need to make sure that they, um, well, we can do things as a country that put a thumb on the side of democracy, human rights, and the values that we care about as the preferred outcome here, not the ones that the Chinese care about, which are antithetical to those. And I believe that if we can work with the, the national unity government and the forces that have emerged that are far more progressive um, what we saw from the last NLD government, to be quite frank, um, even, you know, especially at the grassroots level, they're much more progressive and much more diverse and open-minded. And Ken Omar can speak to this more fluidly than I can. But there is an opportunity here to empower a better path for this country. But we've got to lean into it a bit more than we've been doing up to now. We've been taking a very cautious and incremental approach up to now. And there are a number of steps we can take that would help move us forward. Um, most of them pretty low cost and low risk, frankly. 
Well, I appreciate your answer, and I appreciate the caution as well. However, we've been talking about the Rohingya issue. I mean, I'm actually surprised there are any Rohingya left at this point. But that having been said, what would be in the national unity government? What would what would be the position or where would Suchi be in in such a such an arrangement that the United States would support? I certainly don't want to see the United States kind of go from the pan into the fire, so to speak. I would actually love to have Ken Omar answer that question because she works a lot with these issues of of how to address this problem within Bama politics. All right. Thank you. Is it OK? Can I get the question again, please? I'm sorry. Yeah. You know what? What position would Suchi have in a national unity government that the United States would support? What what would be her influence? What would be her position? Would she have no influence? No. Because we're essentially we're essentially talking about potentially supporting someone who's again is antithetical to our to our efforts regarding the Rohingya. So we just need to know what we're getting into here. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Just for us as our organization, Progressive Voice and our partners who work to advance the human rights agenda and as well as for the protection of the vulnerable communities, including the Rohingya community. For us, we are putting forth our suggestions to the national unity government that they must actually come up with a clear policy and stand on the issue for the Rohingya peoples and the protection and how the government will actually take on this issue without without waiting for like anyone like Dawn San Suu Kyi. Unfortunately, the time has expired. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Thank you. The time has expired. I now recognize Representative Ted Deutsch of Florida, who's the chair of the subcommittee on the Middle East, North Africa and global counterterrorism for five minutes. Thanks so much, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank the witnesses for appearing before the committee today and for the important testimony from all of you. It it seems to have become a hallmark of our work on this committee to hear, unfortunately, again and again about the constant, relentless threat authoritarianism poses to democracies and democratic values. And as with anti-democratic backsliding elsewhere, the struggle in Burma is one that that we can't ignore. I'm really grateful for today's hearing. I've said before the battle lines of the fight to protect democratic values and human rights transcend state boundaries and peoples. And it's imperative that those who stand for democracy everywhere, including here in the United States, recognize one another as partners in that struggle. So in that vein, I've been encouraged by many of the administration's actions to pressure the top of God, support the Burmese people, including economic, diplomatic and humanitarian measures. But it's clear that, as we've discussed, that more can and should be done. I'm disappointed that ASEAN didn't include releasing political prisoners among its five points of consensus. Troubled, as we've been discussing, the Tamil Nadu has failed to heed ASEAN's call for ending violence. And and I hope that coming out of here, there will be even greater urgency beyond this committee to resolve the crisis in Burma and fuel positive momentum behind the legitimate demands of its people, including the Rohingya community and other persecuted minorities who have suffered so much in recent years. And I want to actually talk about the ethnic minority inclusion in the resistance. And Ambassador Curry, you noted in your testimony that increased awareness of and empathy for the situation of ethnic people among Burma protesters has been one of the most remarkable and important features. But we've also heard that there is a strong feeling among some ethnic groups, including the Rohingya community, that the national unity government, federal democracy charter need to be more inclusive. We've talked about that here today. What more can our government, can the United States government and like minded partners do really to promote inclusion and full representation of all ethnic communities in Burma and help help the credibility of the national unity government, which where that's sorely lacking? I think that's a great question. First, we can't solve this problem for the Burmese people. The solutions for it do have to come from within Burma because it's it's these are problems that predate the founding of the country. Just as in our own country, we've had to struggle with 
the issues that, that came into our society through the founding of our country with slavery and racism and all of these things, the same challenges are there in Burma. And they've spent the past 70 years since independence, more or less under authoritarian and very um, racist and chauvinistic governments that have not allowed any of those conversations to take place. So some of those conversations are essentially frozen in 1960 or 1950. So if you think about our own experience and where we were back at that time and our own discussions around racism, you can understand how far they have to go and how quickly they have to move to catch up to what the modern world expects from a country in terms of how it treats its ethnic nationalities and minority communities and vulnerable communities. I think what Ken Omar said is right, the groups that are pushing within Burmese politics to change this dynamic are critical to it and will continue to be. We have to continue to empower those voices and, and reflect them in our own engagement with the national unity government and then use what leverage we do have Again, we, we want to support the national unit government. It's obviously better than the coup, as, Chair, as Mr. Sherman said, but that's not good enough. I think we do have to hold them to a standard of expecting them to acknowledge and do better on Rohingya than the NLD did in the past. I've seen some, some movement in that way. It's not fast enough. It's not far enough, but I think it is in the right direction overall, and we need to do the things we can to facilitate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Ms. Omar, if I could just ask you about your concerns with respect to the treatment of refugees in the border regions. What, and again, what more can the United States and the international community do to ensure that their basic human rights are protected when they flee Burma to their neighboring countries? Thank you very much, Representative Jish. Um, so for now, this uh, challenge that uh, the people are having is the neighboring countries' government, such as Thailand, uh, are not uh, allowing the people to, like uh, those who are fleeing from the airstrikes, to come across the border to their country, while also there are um, uh, no free uh, passage or the uh, humanitarian corridors are not allowed to open to reach to those most needy ones across the border back in Burma. So I think I, uh, we would like to really see your support and your, uh, in your communication and um, advocating to the Thai government in particular to help open those uh, uh, humanitarian aid corridors. Chamber's time has expired. I now recognize Representative Ann Wagner of Missouri, who's the vice ranking member of the full committee for five minutes. I thank, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for organizing this uh, very important hearing. What is happening in Burma is a, a tragedy, and my heart breaks for the Rohingya who continue to suffer unimaginable atrocities at the hands of the genocidal Burmese military or uh, Tatmawada, uh, and for the courageous protesters braving the brutal crackdown as they fight uh, for democracy. The United States must continue to support the people of Burma as they stand up to the military junta and to bring to justice those responsible for egregious human rights violations uh, and crimes against humanity. I'm very proud that Congress has never hesitated to call the violence against Rohingya what it is, genocide. Uh, the United States has now at last recognized the Uyghur and uh, Armenian genocides, but has not yet recognized the Rohingya genocide. Ambassador Curry, why has the United States neglected to make a formal determination on Rohingya genocide? Um, I believe that a lot of it goes back to this kind of trade-off that we've danced around a little bit here, which is this belief that we had to protect Democrat, the Burma's democratic transition, and we were trying in the past to protect Aung San Suu Kyi and not destabilize the country and, and promote or, or encourage or trigger a coup by the military. But I think the lesson we should learn from the past um, four years of refusing to call things by their right name and you're right it meets all the criteria for genocide and the yes. u.s has done it the, the state department did an investigation has compiled the data it's all there um to for anybody who wants to see it but and and i think now that we've seen that the trying to trade off the rights of a vulnerable minority to protect 
a very fragile and flawed democratic process, you end up with both getting stomped all over. And so I, I think that we should be true and call things by their right name. I totally agree with it's you. It's time. It is, it is, um, it is past time. Uh, the International Court of Justice, or ICJ, has ordered Burma to take action to prevent further acts of genocide as it investigates the atrocities committed uh, against the Rohingya. Yet human rights groups report the regime continues to actively destroy evidence and engage in acts of genocide. Ambassador Curry, how should the United States lead international efforts to pressure Burma into compliance uh, with the ICJ's order? Again, I think this is an area where we can work with the national unity government to set out some benchmarks for cooperation with the ICJ investigation. To They are very interested in having the ICJ investigate also um, at the post-coup activities. We've also been supporting the um, international investigative mechanism on Myanmar, the IIIM, at the mm -hmm. in Geneva under UN auspices. It's headed by a wonderful American lawyer named Nick Kumjian, who does a great job and is also expanding their remit to include events since the coup. And so I think that there is an opportunity to take a more holistic look at accountability and transitional justice, as Ken Omar has said, and, and really bring all of these things into a rubric that allows for a meaningful conversation about accountability with the Tamadaw, whether it's in the ICJ context, um, the ICC, or through other mechanisms, um, including local mechanisms that the NUG could um, start to set up themselves with support well, from donors. And to that point, um, Ms. Omar, Burma's civil society organizations have formed kind of the backbone of the opposition movement pr protesting the coup, um, with the Tatmadaw working to isolate Burmans from the international community and resist the flow of information. How can the United States strengthen these civil society groups, uh, Ms. Omar? Thank you, thank you. Um, um, we at this point, for the last ten years of all of the the, the great work uh, our civil society uh, partners have done on the ground, building the blocks for the like uh, you know like a democracy. Now uh, with this military coup, it's been uh, very challenging. Uh, everything that uh, we have built seems like it's we are losing at the moment. So yes, we need desperate uh, help. We desperately need your help and support. By first is also I was I would make it very practical, uh, like the USAID, um, for example, uh, the USAID um, grants can make it flexible to the civil society organizations who are losing their ground in the country to be able to have access uh, from the uh, cross border, for example, you know, which is not something that we 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 have seen uh, the USAID has been able to do. So we would like that kind of flexibility. Thank you. Well, thank you. My my time's expired, Mr. Chairman. Back. Thank you. Thank you. I now recognize Representative Bill Keating of Massachusetts, who is the chair of the subcommittee on Europe, Energy, and the Environment and Cyber for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I'd like to thank you and the ranking member for holding this meeting. Um, I think my uh, question would be directed at uh, Keen Omar uh, and um, maybe a secondary question to uh, Ambassador Curry. But the Burmese military. Uh, is notorious for its use of sexual and gender-based violence as a weapon of war. And it still seems to be holding true, uh, as seen with the relentless uh, perpetrated uh, acts of violence uh, you know, by security forces against protesters. Uh, and despite this, uh, the women that are involved in this in particular, they're risking their lives and playing a central role uh, in this nonviolent action of protest to bring about democracy. So my question is, uh, what's your view of the status of their involvement uh, right now, the risk they're taking, which we're seeing so many brave women around the world in leadership roles of protests in countries like Belarus, and what can we do to support their actions in particular? Thank you, Congressman Keating. Um, yes, you're very right, um, even compared to our time back in 1988 uh, democracy movement, this movement have seen much more young women in particular at the forefront leading the movement. Uh, but now uh, many of them are in, in prison, in detention, and also facing this sexual and gender-based violence, uh, sexual assaults. 
Um, so it's very worrying for me personally. I have met so many uh, survivors of the military rape uh, from the different ethnic communities for the last 20 years as, at least. And now knowing that there are so many young women are even missing, that, that we don't know where they are. So it's very uh, worrying for, for us to, to think of like, you know, what could have happened or, or will be happening. So many of them already are in hiding at the moment. And many of them fled uh, into the ethnic areas at the moment. So, well, we uh, we need so much support. Also, uh, like I think, like the U.S. Uh, 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 good officers, you know, including the 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 mission uh, in in Yango, will be able to help support. For example, like the uh, hiding places, which is the practical support that we need, and in, as well as also establishing the secure communications uh, equipment. Again, that is also something that we need in order for the, including those young women and women in the movement to be able to access or the, uh, communicate to, to the outside world. So these are the practical uh, support that we need along with the other uh, material and financial support as well. And, and how important is it, um, hopefully in a democracy going forward, to have women included in that government and in uh, the administration of government in the country? Um, being a long-term uh, women's rights activist, I still, I, I can, I will be very practical with you. It's still a long way to go. However, I'm encouraged to see that NUG, the, this NUG government has uh, included many women, including the young women also from the ethnic, uh, ethnic uh, communities are uh, already included as in the ministry of positions, which I take it as a very historical step which I, I hope that it will actually carry on as you know, by the time when the, the, the democracy comes back that for us to re, like establish the full democracy, we, we, I hope that women will not be left out or, or, or marginalized when the, everything comes back to be in the place. Uh, for now, uh, we still have a long way to go. Yes. Yeah. We are seeing authoritarian governments try and press themselves around the world, but it's comforting to know we're seeing so many women and young women rising up uh, for democracy and standing up for that. Uh, thank you for your comments and I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Representative Yield back, Representative Keating yield back, I now recognize Representative Tim Burchett of Tennessee for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, guests. Um, I have a couple of questions and I'll just throw it out to the panel. Um, does China really have a dog in this fight, or will the uh, Chinese Communist Party um, simply back the side it thinks will win? I, I'll go ahead and take that. Um, China definitely has had a dog in the fight in Burma for since before, um, since for decades, really. The Chinese Communist Party helped to create the Communist Party of Burma armed it and led to instability in Burma since the 60s, which is one of the reasons that there's been military government in Burma since the 60s. It's because of Chinese interference in Burmese internal affairs and attempts to shape and mold the country and make it malleable. China seeks a Burma that's dependent, weak, internally divided, and easy for it to get what it wants out of, which right now primarily consists of passage to the Indian Ocean, because Burma cuts Burma, the China's path to the Indian Ocean cuts directly through Burma. And so they want that very much. They are very, they have strategic interests, they have economic interests. Um, they're, they, and as you know, they obviously, I think ideologically they'll, they're neutral. They've shown they'll work with whatever kind of government does come along. So I don't think those things are mutually exclusive, but they, they do want a government that's willing to work with them. They do want to keep us out. They especially want to keep us out of Upper Burma where they are involved with a lot of the ethnic armed organizations and are playing both sides of the street in Burma. It's a very, um, they have strategic depth in Burma in a way that the United States does not. But that also means that they've got, they've been tagged with a nasty history of doing things in Burma that the United States hasn't and that can redound against them if we are standing on the side of the people in the country. Anybody else on that? Is that pretty much it? Okay, great. Um, if the Western com uh, companies end up leaving due to the unrest, do you think that China would end up taking over the, the Western assets? Omar, do you want to take that? 
please, uh, please go ahead, Kelly. Thank you. Um, I, I think that, you know, it's a possibility, but the other thing you have to remember about the Tatmadaw, and we've talked a lot about what the Chinese want, but the Tatmadaw are also quite anti-Chinese themselves. They aren't, you know, they're not just anti, they're kind of anti everybody. They're quite xenophobic and nationalistic. So I think that there is a limit to which Chinese incursion into the country. When they did open up the country back in 2010, it was largely because they felt they had become too dependent on China in the pre in the preceding years and wanted to and didn't not and they don't want to be that dependent on the Chinese again. So they will seek to retain um, independence of operation and won't and they'll look for other partners, whether it's um, other Asian partners are more likely the Singaporeans, even the Japanese and South Koreans have been more amenable to working with military led governments than the United States with some of the European partners. All right. Uh, what are the implications for the instability in Burma on more of on a broader, I guess, um, regional security issue? Anybody? Um, I will. I will say the regional security issue. There are actually different, uh, 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 quite a few. I will say first is the. The, uh, the the spillover effects uh, into the neighboring countries, particularly the people who are actually fleeing uh, from the military violence, uh, as we see now. But also, uh, traditionally, in the past uh, decades, people have been fleeing uh, Burma for all, all kinds of reasons across the border, uh, including as the uh, migrant laborers. So there is this uh, regional, uh, you know, there is an impact on the regional stability from that aspect. Uh, that comes with the other, uh, like uh, 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 the health as well, especially now during the COVID, uh, the pandemic time. And you can imagine of how also the, uh, the, the neighboring countries might be thinking at the moment, but, but the reality is Myanmar people, Burma people really need to uh, uh, flee for their, their security. So that's one. The other is we have this drug problem where the military themselves have been involved and implicit, complicit in that along with their militias that they have set up. And so these are also the, uh, the, 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 the issues that the, the region, uh, the, especially for the ASEAN, uh, have been dealing and need to deal with, which we feel quite uh, uh, frustrated that ASEAN is not able to see that they need to focus the solution for Burma uh, based on the people instead of uh, based on the, the military. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Another excellent meeting. I now recognize Representative Ami Berra of California, who's the chair of the subcommittee on Asia, the Pacific, Central Asia, and nonproliferation for five minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and again, thank you for this, this timely hearing. Um, you know, as I think about, um, you know, the resolve of the Burmese people, it's quite remarkable. I, I've heard up to 90% of the country is currently shut down with, you know, essentially a general strike, which it probably is the largest general strike that I, I can recall in, in my lifetime. And it doesn't seem like that that resolve is, is shifting. If, if nothing else, it seems like the Burmese people are, are digging in, even with the hardship, you know, electricity shut down, water shut down, um, food markets, everything shut down. At the same time, when I listen to the Tatmada, um, it also doesn't seem like their resolve is, is changing as well, even as, you know, we put in sanctions, increase sanctions, you know, perhaps, you know, consider secondary sanctions and, and, and the like to continue to isolate them. I, I guess a question for any of the, the witnesses, um, within the, the military, you know, the, the generals certainly seem to not care about what's happening to the civilians, but within the rank and file military, as they exert violence against their own fellow citizens and, and others, are we seeing an, uh, any erosion of um, that and folks defecting and, you know, et, et cetera? Um, yes, I will take the, 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 the question, yeah. So, um, yes, there are actually uh, many hundreds uh, and perhaps even a few thousands of police have joined the civil disobedience movement, as well as those from the the army are also joining. We have uh, some uh, level, like including the police chief, for example, 
uh, position as well as those who are the captain level from the military are uh, also joining. Um, but of course, we're not seeing to the point of like the, the large scale or the large number. Uh, I think that the, the problem is also that because the military already kept them within like a, they are also living themselves in the open prison. Uh, that there there have been an internet cut to the uh, military and military family members. So there are a lot of these measures and restrictions are already imposed. What worse for them is like if they are found to be you know, like uh, suspicious of even joining the people's movement, they will be immediately put in jail and face a lot of uh, harsh uh, punishments. So I think we are having to that 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 situation. But I have to say though that there are so many that we know. There are so many, including the high levels, who want to join the civil disobedience movement or who who just disagree with the the the, the military coup. I can add to that. There have been some defections. What we're also seeing is a lack of will to fight on the front lines because you have to remember that even before the coup, there was a civil war going on in Burma and had been since 1948. And what um, what we're hearing from some of the ethnic arms organizations is that they are seeing um, people just running away from the front lines, um, abandonment of posts and bases on a scale that they're not used to seeing. And so there, there is some question um, about whether, you know, about um, order and discipline within the ranks. I think that that there is a, a that is a potential point of exploitation. Great. And are there any um, specific steps that you know we ought to be thinking about as Congress to to again support, you know, you know both the people, but also. I think if the, the rank and file start to you know, that that um, the, the morale of the rank and file military start to erode the longer this goes on, I think then you can get to an end point perhaps. If Congress can op if Congress can authorize cross border assistance at scale um, and make it very flexible so that it can be used to support. Um, you know, the de deserters who leave the military, some DDR and, and um, things that are going on to demobilize people, that would be helpful because there are um, groups within the, in the cross-border space that could carry out that mission. And I think that's something that would be helpful. The other thing that the United States can do is really make sure that we are leaning heavily on the side of the NUG and against the junta on things like, on really technical things like not giving agreement to um, diplomats that, they, that the junta tries to send to the United States or to other countries. We can all refuse that and to extend visas for, for diplomats who are loyal and for others who are loyal um, to the to the regime to the NUG. Thank you. Fired. I now recognize Representative Andy Barr of Kentucky for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I join my colleagues in condemning the junta and the Tatmadaw's uh, military coup, the unlawful detention of the state counselor, uh, declaration of martial law, and the human rights abuses against uh, civil disobedience and peaceful protesters. This is clearly, obviously, a major setback for democracy in Burma. Uh, but I want to return um, uh, Ambassador Curry to the important strategic implications uh, and, and the considerations that we have to give to, to, to China's malign influence in the region. Um, you, you did a good job painting the picture for us in terms of China's longstanding interest in, in Burma. Um, but can you, can you elaborate a little bit on what ties exist between the CCP and the Tatmada? And um, obviously, I, I heard your testimony that the Tatmada was skeptical of Chinese investment in Burma, that uh, Burma's uh, prior civilian government was perhaps closer to uh, the Chinese Communist Party. But given the current state of affairs and the coup, uh, what inroads uh, are the CCP making with uh, the, the current military leadership? I think that the, the situation is, is never quite black and white. I don't, it, it's not, you know, it, it's not a zero sum game in, in many ways. I think that what we're seeing is that the Tamadaw will never want to be dependent on the CCP 
Um, and the people of Burma will never accept a government that's completely dependent on the CCP. This isn't um, Cambodia, for instance, where you can get away with that sort of thing, like Hun Sen has been able to get away with it in Cambodia. The other thing that I think that more than more than democracy, the Chinese Communist Party does not want state failure at its border. There, you know, it shares a border with Burma, and there are um, ethnic groups that straddle that border. That and and you've we've seen in recent days that they've put up heavy fencing and cameras to try to reinforce their border with Burma to keep um, refugee flows out. They and and they also are cognizant that there's a lot of crime and illicit activity that goes on across that border. That it can be a vector for disease and criminality as well. If if there's state failure and breakdown on the Burma side of the border, it negatively impacts China's aspirations in Southwest China to improve the economic and economic situation in Sichuan province and in that area. So they don't want that. They will try to work this. They will fail to get navigate the situation as best they can and and do you know they'll play all sides they don't they're not they have no moral compunction about working with anybody i mean let's be very clear whereas we do yes. we do have a limiting principle they don't understand. that's the main difference uh, i understand ambassador but let me let me just ask you to kind of comment on the fact that beijing along with moscow have have blocked um uh the, the u.n security council statement condemning the coup your your testimony was pretty rich about the failure of the Security Council. I mean, if, if China is a big player in blocking um, the condemnation of the coup at the Security Council level, what, what do you read into that? What, what is going on? What is the CCP trying to accomplish there? Well, China typically tries to block things like this at the Security Council. It's not necessarily Burma specific. Um, they have a whole excuse matrix that they will basically have to be worked through in order to get to them being willing to abstain on any resolution that would involve insertion in what they consider to be a matter of internal affairs of a country. And they and Russia both still consider the coup to be a matter, an internal matter for Burma, and therefore not actually a matter of international peace and security. Now, what we need to do is put them on the spot a little bit more. I believe, and I think that if they, up to now, because all the meetings in the council have taken place behind closed doors, all the negotiations on statements have taken place behind closed doors, they've been able to hide behind all of that. If we push some of this more out into the public, then they have to be more accountable for what they're doing in the council. Right now, they haven't blocked anything because the UK hasn't brought forward a resolution. So there's been nothing for them to really block well, except for I statements. Uh, in my remaining time, just really quickly, and, and I didn't get a chance to ask about uh, uh, Chinese uh, vaccine diplomacy in Burma, but it broadly, how can the U.S. prevent Chinese malign influence in Burma? By associating ourselves with the people and the positive aspects of this movement that have such broad popular support. Let us start with the time. Yield back. I now recognize Representative Joaquin Castro of Texas, who's the chair of the Subcommittee on International Development, uh, International Organizations, and Global Social Impact for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I joined Rep. Tenney in introducing a resolution urging the United Nations Security Council to impose an arms embargo on the Burmese military. Uh, Ambassador Chow Moon Thun, uh, I know you've also been urging the same action. So, Ambassador, can you explain the dynamics at the UN Security Council around imposing such an embargo? What countries are preventing this action, and what can we in Congress do to help? Um, thank you, thank you, Mr. Castro. Uh, in the Security Council, you know, so I I, I oppose uh, the China uh, with regard to we like to have it, you know, stronger action from the uh, Security Council. Uh, but China clearly uh, stated to me that uh, so whatever resolution that include sanction regime, they were not accept it. But for for us, we need really strong action from uh, from Security Council. So that is why I fully agree with Kerry that you know we make it things uh, open op open uh, open setting. So that's the way we can push. Harder than handle, and I also wish that you know, United States, together with United Kingdom, to push harder in the Security Council. 
That's the way we can get something from the Security Council. Now, it is the press statement, the presidential statement is not really enough uh, for, uh, for the people of Myanmar because what we are facing at this time is saving lives of innocent civilians. So that is why we need stronger action from the UN Security Council. So we need to push it further and harder. But the, the difficult thing that we uh, hear in the Security Council is facing is the COVID, uh, COVID setting. Uh, because you know those you know the agenda there is no consensus then it will be difficult to have an open debate on the in the particular issue that is the you know uh, that I always have the feedback from our colleagues from the UN Security Council but we need to push harder and harder to have something from the UN Security Council for the for sake of the people of Myanmar thank you thank you and ambassador many of us in Congress have spoken out strongly against the coup and urge for stronger actions like sanctions against the military. And we're in agreement that the military should restore democracy and return back power to the civilian government, which you represent. But if we're honest with ourselves, when the civilian government was nominally in charge of the country, things weren't exactly peaceful. Most notably, what many have called genocide occurred against the Rohingya. Obviously, the civilian government had only limited power and the violence was done by the military. However, the civilian government was not critical of these actions and was in many ways supportive. Was this a mistake on the part of the civilian government? And if the civilian government is restored, will it take actions to allow for the voluntary and safe return of the Rohingya people? Yeah, I, I think the outside the NUG is very clear that you know we we respect the you know the uh, agreement that bilateral agreement that we we have with country concerned. Uh, Bangladesh, and then also we will pursue the address the issue with the uh, the international norms and standards as well as human rights norm and standards. That is what we are definitely we are going to pursue it. So the NUG is an inter interim government, so that we are going to do it once the you know the full blown uh, the government is being established. So we, it is uh, we will address the issue with the international norms and standards. So those. Those whoever have the you know the the right, we have to respect it. So who, those whoever inside in the country, we have to uh, to respect it. Equal equality should be respected. So that you know those who are in, now in in the Bangladesh side, we are always welcome and uh, then back to 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 Myanmar. So we will definitely pursue with the you know the agreement that we work with with Bangladesh. So we welcome them uh, to to live together with us. In, 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 in the peace and harmony. That is what we are looking for. Thank you. I yield back, Chairman. Chairman yields back. I now recognize Representative Claudia Kinney of New York, Vice Ranking Member of the Subcommittee on International Development, International Organizations and Global Corporate Social Impact for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for having this important meeting as well, along with uh, the ranking member. And I also want to say thank you to my colleague, uh, Representative Castro, for being the lead on this with me, and so many other members who have joined on and why this is so important to me and my district. I have over 4,000, maybe 5,000 Burmese refugees, many who have become citizens and outstanding members of our community. They've been coming to our community for many, many years. Um, they've been vigilant and diligent in um, protecting the rights of their family members and friends and marching peacefully throughout our community to defend um, the d democratic principles uh, in Burma. And so we are doing everything we can to support them. And uh, uh, Mr. Castro actually kind of took my question, but I thought I'd maybe uh, give the ambassador, um, you know, another chance to take a look at it. I, I just wanted to maybe pose it in a different way um, when we're discussing the um, you know, the, the, the bill that we put in in our UN Security Council uh, arms embargo that we proposed. Uh, do you think, uh, and I know this is this is gonna be directed to Ambassador Kwame Soon, uh, do you think that the, um, that obviously we're gonna be struggling to get this through China and through Russia uh, because they control so much in the Security Council and you indicated you're keeping in touch. Um, how, do you think that the possibility of working with India or Vietnam and other members to pressure them in a public way as we're trying to do would have any impact on them and, and bring them to understand the human rights violations 
and the issues that we are and, and trying to restore the democratically elected government back in uh, in Burma. Ambassador. Yes, th thank you, uh, Ms. Claudia. I think it is this is very important that you know the we need to put pressure on the some members of the Security Council, you know, through all uh, from different channels, you know, through uh, India, through uh, B uh, Vietnam, and the others in the Europe and the Latin America and the Africa. We need to do it through the all channels. That that most important th thing is we need to point out that this is saving lives, not nothing else. So this, this is the humanitarian crisis that we are facing. So without intervention from the UN Security Council, the people uh, in Myanmar will be killed more and more. And if we, we, you wait for a minute, uh, an hour, a day, the more people will be killed. So that, you know, there is immediate action from the UN Security is very, very needed. And then the, the intervention from the UN Security Council and international community is needed. So we better to put it the way that you know, saving lives, that is humanitarian, saving lives, and it is the noble tax for the human being. So that is what we really need from the international community, and that we need the leadership of the UN, uh, United States in this regard. Thank you. Do you think the U.S. should consider secondary type sanctions uh, to target other countries, maybe who have more extensive trade? with Burma, and I'm thinking things like limiting not just the arms trade, but possibly expanding the commercial trade, investment in gems, uh, timber, energy resources, obviously very important, uh, revenue for the Kathmandu leadership. Is that something that we could possibly do as a, as a, a unit in America, a uni unified front from America? Yeah, you, you know, getting a resolution that involves the sanction from the UN Security Council is, may take time. But uh, time is really of the essence for the for us. So what we need is that is some sort of you know targeted coordinated sanction from a group of country like a group of, uh, of uh, like-minded countries imposed on, uh, on this kind of you know sanction. Then it will definitely have the impact on the military as well as those in the region. So that is what we needed. So it's a def uh, coordinated targeted defer sanction from a group of country is, you know, it's, it, it, the, this can do it, you know, very quickly manner. And uh, because when we are waiting the, uh, the any action from the Security Council, we can do it as a coordinated manner. I know you may have answered this question. I just wanted to run it by you again. Do you think that it was a mistake for the ASEAN uh, agreement to uh, recognize or acknowledge the junta leader, Min Aung Hong, as Burma's representative? Do you think that was a mistake? Uh, it's a, as a diploma, it's a very difficult to say, but it's a, it's a, one, it's a, the outcome come out from the uh, ASEAN leaders meeting. It is, it's, to me, it's very disappointing. Thank okay. you. Do you think that the five point, we're missing anything in the five point uh, consensus from the ASEAN leaders summit? That yeah, of course, this is very, they missed a very important point. They should add the, you know, calling and the release of you know the leaders, the Aung San Suu Kyi president, Wu Yin, and the other and lawful de detainees, unconditionally and immediately. That is very very much important point that they they are missing because you know this is linked to the uh, meaningful dialogue among the uh, relevant stakeholder. Without release of them, there will not be any meaningful dialogue among the relevant stakeholder. This is very. Do you important. think those leaders in exile are? Well, time has expired. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank and you, I Mr. Ambassador. I appreciate your comments. I now recognize Representative Dina Titus from Nevada for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ambassador Toon, I just tell you how much we respect your courage for being with us today and speaking out about the terrible things happening in your country. I'd like to ask you and Ms. Omar about the humanitarian side of things. If you could comment on just the struggles that everyday people are facing in their lives from shelter to food to just living essentials. The UN has reported that more than 2 million people are facing growing food insecurity due to the political crisis, but compounded by COVID. And they are expected to uh, rank, scale up their uh, program to provide nutrition assistance in Burma I wonder if you could talk to us about what the daily life is like, how the U.S. might work with other 
uh, agencies through the UN or other countries to provide some of the supplies that might be needed and what we can do to guarantee that those supplies actually get to the people who need them the most. May I go ahead with this? Uh, Please. Uh -huh. Thank you very much. So um, thank you for this question. Right now, the the, the humanitarian challenge is really immense. Uh, it's actually uh, getting quite widespread across the country. For First of all, is also because this military hunter is, like I was saying in the statement, they are, they are in fact destroying the people's uh, uh, food storage. At the same time, they are trying to actually um, uh, steal even the uh, the people uh, the, from the like uh, rights as reserve like that, but and the other problem is those are uh, civil servants and public and uh, private sector workers who have joined the this movement. There are like tens of thousands of them, and 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 across the country, and they don't they don't get the the salary for the last three months already. And you can imagine how desperate the, the, the their family situation would be. And many of them were even kicked out of their uh, public housing by this yeah. hunter at gunpoint. And also now, like, you know, now, right now, the civil servants are now being forced uh, to the point that they were, some of them were at gunpoint, but some of them were actually told that they have to return the past two months salary if they don't come and work right now. So that's that's where the challenges they are facing. The civil society also where the many people depend on uh, the, 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 the civil society uh, organizations are being raided. And they are bank uh, bank accounts that the donors are supporting them are now sort of like you know more or less seized by the the, the military because if you go uh, to to uh, get the money from the bank you will be asked so many questions to the point that you like you know they they will end up being arrested many of them are very worried about that so they don't have access to the money and they are not getting salary either so that's where uh, we are having uh, so much problem and many of the uh, factory um, uh, factories are also closed. So now that, that that people are not having this regular income for the last three months. So yes, it is a very uh, serious situation. The banks are almost bankrupt. Or, I'm sorry, banks are, um, are also collapsed. So I think we are having a very serious situation at the moment, yes. Thank you, thank you. I was afraid that that was the case. Ambassador Toon, you wanna to add to that? I know, I, I know some of the USAID were, folks were there working with some of the civil society, but I'm sure all of that's gone now. Yeah, yeah indeed, I agree with uh, Ms. Ken Omar with regard to what she, she, she responded to get to your, your question. So because, you know, the, it is really, we are now in a humanitarian crisis because, you know, the uh, the the, the, uh, the economy is, according to the UN, it's, it's going to collapse. So that is the, the, the serious situation that we are, we are having. So we cannot prolong this kind of crisis you know, for the uh, for for our future. Uh, so we need to take action as quick as possible. People now, people are really in the dire situation. Uh, and I definitely can coming you know months. It's a more difficult situation that you know people will be facing. So that is why we we always stress that we need immediate action from the international community to stop the, the situation that we are facing. Yeah, the United Nations High Commissioner on Human Rights said in late March that Burma may be headed for full blown conflict like you're seeing in Syria. Is your assessment of it that dire and that uh, immediate? Uh, the, uh, thank you, uh, may I take this question? Uh, I, th uh, I think that, that is what we want to avoid, but the situation that we are, we, we, we are facing- The gentleman's time has expired. I now recognize Representative Peter Meyer of Michigan. Okay. Representative Meyer, unmute. Representative Meyer, we'll come back to Representative Meyer. I now recognize Representative Young Kim of California, the ranking vice member of California on Asia, the Pacific, Central Asia, and non-proliferation for five minutes. 
Thank you, Chairman Mix, and thank you, uh, Ranking Member McCall. You know, we had this uh, uh, briefing our committee first held on the situation in Myanmar in February. Uh, since then, my office has received calls and requests from the small but very significant number of Burmese Americans to meet with them and participate in the rallies that they organized to raise awareness of the ongoing human rights situation. And so I greatly appreciate uh, our committee taking the time to discuss this ongoing crisis in Myanmar. This has really resulted in a deteriorating civil and human rights situation the, the murdering of unarmed civilians and continued persecution of ethnic minorities, all at the hands of a brutal military junta that unilaterally seized power in a coup against Myanmar's democratically elected government in February. However, Myanmar is no stranger to conflict and strife. Over the past few decades, the ethnic minorities of Myanmar have been subjected to targeted violence from the military and militias, as well as larger scale ethnic cleansing campaigns, stimulating widespread unrest and forcing hundreds of thousands to flee their homes into refugee camps in neighboring countries. With the coup in February, these trends are likely to worsen further. So question to you, Ambassador Curry, what new challenges may arise in the weeks and months ahead, including the possibility of new refugee flows to neighboring countries or the deepening of the country's decades long civil war. So how, how should the United States seek to avoid such scenarios and what could Congress do to guide the US policy? Thank you, Congresswoman Kim. Um, I believe that the biggest threat right now is complete state collapse and state failure um, with the economy, going just completely in free fall the govern the governance structures that the junta relies on to um govern the country have collapsed for in many places or are only being held up through martial law and at the point of a gun you're really looking at at a state failure scenario if the trends continue um at the levels of violence and the level of non-cooperation from the population continues you just they are on a collision course right now and yes this will inevitably lead to greater refugee outflows across the region um, and will really and lead to um, increased criminality increased um, uh, narcotics trafficking just all sorts of ill effects across the region I think that what the United States Congress can do is as I mentioned in previous mentioned previously, explicitly authorized cross-border assistance that will allow U.S. humanitarian assistance, including assistance provided through U.N. agencies, funds, and programs to reach those who are um, fleeing into what are called liberated or safe areas that are under the control of ethnic nationality arms group, armed groups and be willing to deal with those um, local authorities in those areas. Also, by reinforcing, strengthening, and working directly with the national unity government and helping it to stand up structures that can govern the country, that can distribute humanitarian assistance, that can reach people in need, we can help the Burmese people and make our assistance to them more effective and avoid some of the unintended consequences if we were to, for instance, continue to use existing channels that flow through ministries that are nominally under the control of the junta. We do not want to, to subject our assistance to um, misuse or abuse by the military junta. So we need to go back to our past practice of using parallel and cross-border structures to deliver assistance to the people. Thank you very much. Those are great suggestions. We should take very much uh, take heed of your advice. You know, I, I, I will also like to highlight the role of uh, ASEAN that it has played in attempting to mediate the crisis in Myanmar. Although ASEAN acted in unison to hold a summit with its members in the months following the February coup and released like five point plan to resolve the crisis, multiple missteps have been made along the way that seriously jeopardize the effectiveness of their influence and response. So in particular, um, the summit was jeopardized from the start by inviting a representative of the militia junta to represent Myanmar in negotiations, but uh, excluded any representation from the national unity government. 
you know, ASEAN's capacity to mediate Myanmar's crisis further when after specifically calling for an end to the violence, Myanmar's military continued to quash dissent and protest violently by openly attacking and killing its own people. So Ambassador Kerry, um, the gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman's time has expired. Okay, well, thank you. I hope I can continue this if there is time. Yes, thank you. I am back. I now recognize Representative Ted Lieu of California for five minutes. You're muted, Ted. Thank you, Chairman Meeks, for calling this important hearing. I'd like to follow up on the line of questioning uh, from Representative Brad Sherman. Uh, so Ambassador Toon, was there a representative from the Rohingya? Sorry, I, 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 don't you mind, could you repeat the questions again? Because I missed- The national unity government that was recently formed, does it include a representative of the Rohingya? People. So, so far there's no representative from Rohingya in the NDP. So let me, let me just tell you the problem here. There's an article in Time Magazine dated March 8th, 2018, that estimates more than 43,000 Rohingya parents have been reported lost, presumed dead. Other reports estimate about 25,000 Rohingya mm -hmm. may have been killed. There's a study in January 2018 uh, that estimated that there are also additional 18,000 acts of sexual violence against Rohingya women and girls. And it's estimated that 116,000 Rohingya were beaten and 36,000 were thrown into fires. In a recent New York Times article, I'm just gonna quote from it, states that rather than condemn the systematic executions, rapes and village burnings, Ms. Aung San Suu Kyi, a Nobel Prize laureate, defended the generals. There was little outcry in Myanmar over the brutal persecution of ethnic minorities. Ms. Aung San Suu Kyi defended the military at The Hague, where Myanmar was accused of genocide against Rohingya. Myanmar's diplomats, including Mr. Kyal Mo Toon, fell in line, earning the country's international scorn. So how can we trust that the Rohingya aren't going to be continued to be killed if we support the national unity government? Why should we support you? Uh, Thank you. You know, because you know, as I mentioned earlier, now we we are fighting the common enemy. So you know, all the issues that happen in Myanmar are because of the military. So we first we need to focus on the common enemy first. Then you know, as as I mentioned earlier, the the NUG uh, government where address the issue in line with the you know international norms and standards in line with the you know the the international human rights uh, uh, human rights law and international humanitarian law and then also what we, we what we believe is that NUG is an interim government and then when it came to the you know the permanent one we will be you know because we believe in engagement we believe in dialogue so all the outstanding issues that we face definitely we can resolve it through the uh, dialogue or with the participation from the all relevant stakeholders and the, this kind of inclusive dialogue where find a way uh, uh, to, to get the, you know, uh, to solve the problem. That is what we, we believe is that, you know, that is not what we need, the support from the international community towards the international unity government. Please Thank give you. a chance so, to ask. Let me ask you another question. Can the uh, Rohingya people get citizenship? In your country, yeah, of course, of course, those who are in the, you know, that is why why we, uh, I, what this point now is that you know those, uh, we were the NUG government were pursued in accordance with the international norms and standards. So whoever entitled, they will be uh, get the citizenship, and those who ever get the citizenship, they were enjoying the fundamental rights that the others join. So that is what we believe. We believe in the democracy. We believe in the human rights. That is when whoever inside the country, they have to enjoy the rights, uh, 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 same like the others. That is what we I, believe. So thank you. Um, I'm gonna reclaim my time. So the military coup is unacceptable. And 
I would hope that uh, the military would stop killing people and we need to uh, reverse the coup. At the same time, I don't see uh, any change in national unity government when you can't even include a representative of the Rohingya people. The UNS said that the government of which you were a part of had genocidal intent and ethnic cleansing of Rohingya people. And you still can't even manage to have a representative of the Rohingya people in a unity government. So I cannot support your national unity government. And I will oppose efforts for the United States to support your national unity government until you commit to having at least a representative from the Rohingya people and you commit to stopping the genocide of the Rohingya people. I yield back. Time is expired. Gentlemen, it's expired. I now recognize Representative Meyer. Of, of Michigan for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and, and, and ranking member for holding this hearing today and to our, um, our guests who are joining us uh, to share their uh, wisdom and their experience. Uh, like Ms. Tenney, I also have a significant Burmese population in my district. We have over 4,000 uh, Burmese and Burmese Americans in uh, West Michigan, many of whom uh, were fled during the 1988 coup. Um, which I know um, that both Ambassador Toon uh, and, and Ms. Uh, Omar were, were, um, were, you know, lived through, right, experienced firsthand. Um, I think of, of the earlier comments um, just about how initially when the kind of green shoots of democracy were first occurring, when Aung San Suu Kyi kind of burst onto the scene and then the Nobel Prize, Nobel Peace Prize and all these positive efforts, how much excitement there was that, that after decades of, of kind of brutal repression and military dictatorships and coups, um, that the, the Tat Madao were finally starting to relinquish some of their grasp. Um, I think it's, it's pretty clear to us right now that that was, uh, as, as Ms. Kind of Curry mentioned, that that relinquishment was um, a bit in name only. And I think they, they sought to take the best benefits of that cooling or that, that warming of relations, that thawing of tensions with the rest of the world and the Western world in particular, uh, and, and turn that into being able to line their own pockets and do what they can uh, to further uh, cement their hold on the country. And, and the coup on February 1st, I think made that uh, very clear. Uh, I'm obviously very sympathetic to the tension between the recognition of the, the genocide against the Rohingya and the plight that they're in, um, you know, and balancing how we can achieve stability uh, and, and peace and prosperity in the region in the short term. But I guess I'm, I'm very concerned about the way that the, uh, the kind of the peaceful urban protesters and some of the existing um, fighting organizations like the Kachin Independence Army, which I think just uh, a day and a half ago shot down uh, a helicopter of the, the junta uh, regime. You know, I wanted to ask Ambassador Toon, um, I guess first and foremost, are, are, while, while I see the benefit of, of kind of a rainbow coalition of, um, of various um, ethnic groups kind of coming together who had, who had traditionally been just aligned against the government, but now have common cause in kind of bringing um, you know, where it gets aligned against the Tat Madao and now have common cause in establishing a unity government. Uh, are, do you think that that can be a sustainable balance in the long term, especially when you have, well, when we've seen evidence in the past of, of when long running armed conflicts then try to implement uh, the more reformist uh, democratic mindset individuals and how that can quickly result in the people who have the guns having the say? Could you speak to that, Ambassador Toon? Thank you, thank you, Mr. Maya. Uh, it is it is it's true that you know uh, the uh, that uh, the situation that we are having, especially you know unprecedented unity that we are having at this point. It's analysts that pointed out that it's uh, over 70 years we don't have this kind of unity among different uh, uh, players, different ethnic and uh, organization. It is the, the, the time that we have unprecedented unity. So for sustainability, that is, of course, we also have the concern. You no, know, because now we we are fighting against the common enemy. Once we over this kind of enemy, we still need to talk. That is why we are aiming to have the Federal Democratic Union. So because we want to bring all relevant stakeholders uh, uh, in the equal footing, 
and, uh, and the work together uh, for the country because the Federal Democratic Union, the Constitution, will give them a you know, way to bring everyone together again. So that is the hope. So we always hope for the best, but of course, you know, uh, we prepare for the worst. Of course, we, we have the very, uh, 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 very uh, you, positive points on this regard. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Mr. Ambassador. I think we've, we've spoken to the failures of ASEAN more broadly to try to tackle and, and kind of have a hard framework. So I hope that that um, partners in the region step up. Uh, but just finally, Ms. Curry, uh, can you speak to the fact that if we were to implement sanctions and cut off some of that funding, specifically with Myanmar oil and gas enterprise, do you think that that would really have an operative impact on the Tap Madao survival? I think it would definitely clip their wings. They rely on the revenue from oil and gas substantially for a lot of what they do. The other thing that I think that we could definitely do is put some more pressure on Singapore. Um, the junta is clearly having some challenges with access to hard currency, and they hold accounts in Singapore that continue to be able to participate in purchases and dollar auctions. We need to do more to cut off their access to hard currency, and, and putting sanctions on MOGE would certainly put a big chunk of pressure on them. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're back. Thank you. Um, let me go ahead and recognize the gentleman from Rhode Island, Mr. Cicilline. Thank you. Uh, and I really want to thank Chairman Meeks and Ranking Member McCall for this really important hearing. Uh, I had the fortune of traveling to Myanmar and to meet the Burmese people and to see a nation struggling uh, and, and one that really has uh, attempted to persevere under the weight of successive military dictatorships. But I also had the opportunity to visit the Rohingya in Bangladesh in the camps. And my first question is really to Ambassador Toon. Three quarters of a million Rohingya refugees were forced from Myanmar into Bangladesh at the direction of the Tetmandu. Roughly 600,000 remain in Myanmar, and there is justifiable concern for their well-being and their safety. So what is the current state of Myanmar's remaining Rohingya? How likely are they to be remain safe? And what is the status of the Rohingya refugees? Uh. Thank you, uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Cicely. Uh, uh, of course, to be very frank, under the military government, we all are the same. You know, we are we 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 we, we the human rights violations, atrocity taking uh, taking place everywhere in the country. So we we have uh, concern with each and everyone, including uh, those Rohingya in the camps in in Yakin State. So of course. We, we don't know exactly, uh, to me, I don't know exactly the, uh, the situation, but, but of course we have the concern because they already have the difficulties. So the situation because of the, you know, the, the coup have and compounded the challenges that they already face. So that is why we are keep telling uh, the you know, international community that, you know, please end the, this military coup. Please support us to end the military coup. That is the, what we, we really want. So then the next step will be, you know, we work together to solve the problem, find a sustainable solution with regard to this matter. You know, that is very yeah. important for Mr. all Bassett, of us. Th thank you. I, you know, I've heard your responses to Mr. Liu and Mr. Sherman. I can tell you, I met with members of the Rohingya community who were members of the elected government and no longer have citizenship. So this issue about making the Rohingya a stateless people is a serious one. Democracy means more than uttering the words, it means respecting the basic human rights of all of your citizens. And so I hope you hear the message loudly and clearly that we expect the Rohingya to be repatriated to their own country uh, and obviously uh, be kept safe. But I wanna turn now to a question about food security. Um, the UN has reported more than 2 million people in Burma are facing growing food insecurity due to this crisis and both the political crisis as well as COVID-19 pandemic with families being forced to skip meals, obviously having less nutrition. The World Food Program is scaling up its response in Burma to provide assistance to more than 3.3 million people in the coming months. What is the kind of current status of the humanitarian effort uh, in Burma? And I don't know, Ambassador Curry or Ambassador Tu, who's best prepared to answer that? Uh, may, may, I, may I take, take it? Sure. sure. Yeah. yeah. Thank, thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Because this is a really uh, huge challenge that we are facing. Uh, because uh, the one hand, uh, we we don't want any country 
and to recognize the military, to, uh, to engage with the military. But at the same time, we pay attention for the humanitarian assistance. But that is why what we like to request the international community, including the United Nations and our development partners, whatever the assistance that you make, please consult with the national unity government and go through the CSO and the others and NGOs. That is what we like to, to, to request. The, the humanitarian assistance is very important uh, for, for all of us at this point. I think that uh, Ambassador Kelly may have some more point, points to add. And, and Ambassador Curry, if you could also respond to the independent investigative mechanism for Myanmar. I know there's been some concern about evidence being destroyed. And is this an effort that we can provide additional resources to? This, this is ultimately about accountability. And Facebook, I know uh, the platform was used to spread hate speech against the Rohingya. And the ability to kind of collect that information is going to be really critical. Thank you. Um, I I would add that right now is um, it's it's rice harvesting season. It's the, the dry season. Rice harvest is taking place in very critical that that, that be able to take. Uh, are, can you all hear me? Yes. Um, and on the. I, we need to, to increase U.S. contributions and also work within the Human Rights Council and within the General Assembly to expand the mandate of the WIWM to make sure that they can investigate all the atrocities that have taken place, not just the ones in the Rohingya areas. And they're already doing that to some degree, but we can we can support that more robustly. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Great. Thank you. Um, let me go ahead and recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Kluger. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Uh, discuss this um, important issue and, and uh, obviously uh, take a look at the atrocities that uh, that have happened and, and make sure that we as a country are standing up for for the ideals that uh, that have made America what it is and, and that, uh, that we continue to look around the world uh, ways to, to influence. And so uh, I'd like to start, uh, Ambassador Curry, by just kind of asking about the some of the investments that have been made um, by some Western energy companies, uh, whether it's Chevron or Total or, or some of the others, and, and how important has that infrastructure been um, to helping with the poverty, uh, to helping with some of the um, quality of life uh, throughout the country in the last couple of decades? Um, I would say that on balance, the investments in oil and gas infrastructure, not just by Western countries, but overall, have largely enabled the military to avoid the consequences of its failure to use resources to invest in the people of the country um, and have, have allowed the military to purchase weapons to turn on its own people. The civilian government um, ostensibly gained control of those resources starting in 2010, 2012. Um, and the NLD government controlled them starting in 2015 and started to institute policies under the extractive, um, the extractive Industries Transparency Initiative and other ways to try to make them um, more, make those revenues go more toward the health and welfare of the Burmese people. But now that those re revenues are flowing back into the pockets of the Tamada, they will once again be used to torment the Burmese people, not to support and help them. What What are the chances and the the threat of, you know, if, if they were abandoned and you know um, expropriated, um, or or even worse, you know, is there a threat that the Chinese could somehow take take over those assets and and do something else with them? Can you kind of talk to that uh, that line well, of thinking? It depends on the assets. It, um, you know, you have the offshore facilities off that are in the um, Andaman Sea, and then you have onshore facilities, um, in, including pipelines that cut across. The Chinese already have um, a substantial investment in the oil and gas industry in Burma, um, as does India and even Malaysia and the United States, others. Um, the the Yadana pipeline is a, um, is servicing a mature field. And it, um, there, it's unlikely that it would be um, that the impact of the U.S. withdrawal there would would mean much. 
one of the challenges for the Burmese is that they have no refining capability. So even if they're able to export the oil and, or even if they're able to pump the oil and gas, that they they can't refine it and sell it on the open market. So that's why the Yadana pipeline flows to Thailand, where the Petroleum Authority of Thailand actually refines it and then gives a portion of it back to Burma and then sells the rest on the spot market. So it's a, you know, they're, the one is what I think it, there's a debatable proposition about whether shutting, whether pulling out U.S. Um, investment will have much of an impact. I know that it will take some time for them to be able to replace the U.S. capabilities that are currently allowing the production to continue. And in that time, if we're also working on the financial side to cut off the flow um, or to require that if U.S. Inter entities stay involved, that they put the funds into an escrow account instead of sending them to the military. That's another option where the U.S. companies and other multinationals don't have to withdraw. They just don't pay the royalties to the junta. They put them in an account that's set aside for the people. Um, Ambassador, thank you very much for that explanation. Just uh, very quickly, Ambassador Toon, in, in the remaining 40 seconds, um, it, do, you, do you agree with, uh, you know, kind of the philosophy of making sure that the funds are going to be flowing in the right direction and, and that we don't have some secondary or tertiary effect uh, that could be worse? At this, at this time, the, our focus is to stop any uh, money inflow into the military regime. So whatever way that we can cut off, please do so. That is the, the, the quick question that I'd like to respond. Please cut the money inflow into the military regime. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. With that, I yield. Great. Thank you. Let me go ahead and recognize the gentlelady from Minnesota, Ms. Omar. Uh, thank, thank you. Um, and uh, thanks to, to our panel um, for joining us today for this really critical uh, conversation. I wanted to chat a little bit with Ms. Um, Omar. I know that you have previously been supportive of a UN Security Council referral to the situation in Burma, to the International uh, Criminal Court. Of course, the ICC has claimed some jurisdiction through the Bangladesh referral, and there is also um, an ongoing case at the ICJ regarding the Rohingya genocide. What would you like to see happen in terms of an investigation and uh, prosecution for the atrocity crimes being committed this year? And do you see the ICC as the best venue? Um, should we be thinking about helping set up a hybrid court? Thank you, Congressman Thank you. Omar. Um, yes, uh, um, my my uh, my uh, stand and our organization stand so uh, we we'll still stand on the uh, support of the Myanmar situation overall referral to the ICC. Um, that we know that can only happen with the Security Council uh, referral. So that's why we also are calling for the option, uh, another option, if it is not possible, to set up an ad hoc international tribunal that can be commissioned as well. And um, if the Security Council will not move, that is another possibility uh, through the uh, UN uh, General Assembly as well. So that's something that we've been calling for. And we know the the, the current uh, uh, the jurisdiction that ICC can exercise uh, uh, through the uh, Bangladesh is very limited. It is not enough. It doesn't cover all these uh, 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 all all these uh, uh, violence the, uh, the 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 Rohingya com community faced before they fled into the into Bangladesh. And we need all of these crimes, including the sexual violence against women. All of these are uh, like I met with man many of these uh, Rohingya sisters you know, who are the rape survivors of this military regime, uh, the, the military. So we need to address all of these crimes, but on, on, not only for the Rohingya people, but also for all of the crimes across other ethnic areas, as well as those crimes against humanity happening for the last last three months. And only with the Security Council referral that we will be able to address all of these crimes at the uh, ICC. So we would like for the United States government to also first um, recognize the genocide definition and also support all our efforts uh, to uh, at the Security Council, either to, to refer to ICC or set up a 
an independent ad hoc tribunal. That would be the best uh, 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 option. But we are also calling on the national unity government to actually sign the Rome Statute so that we will be able to uh, have the uh, ICC also look into the other uh, crimes as well. Thank you. I know Curry wants to add something, but let me post this question and then I'll, I'll give you a minute to, to, to do that as well. Obviously, uh, one of the barriers to establishing justice for the victims, both um, with the Rohingyas and the pro-democracy protesters right now is um, destruction of evidence. And I know that you mentioned in your testimony that the um, Burmese military is covering up their uh, gross humanitarian uh, violations. So how can the United States be supportive uh, in terms of documentation um, so that there are there is sufficient evidence uh, when there, the ability for prosecute, prosecution um, can can exist? Um, the, again, to Ms. Omar, and then uh, we'll, we'll let Kerry chime in if you have a couple of seconds. Thank you for this question. Um, for the last uh, a few decades, uh, since the uh, the previous military uh, regime, the local organizations, local civil society organizations, uh, when it comes to the uh, rape and sexual violence, particularly the ethnic women organizations, they've been the one who have been documenting and presenting to the United Nations and inter to the international community. I will come back to this uh, to them uh, for this round as well because they are with the well experience, you know, how to document uh, not only the human rights documentations, but also the evidence collections. And of course, it's very uh, extremely challenging now under this military hunter how to co collect, collect and preserve those uh, uh, evidences. But together with this, uh, 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 the uh, double I double um, the, uh, the the United Nations established mechanism. I think the local civil society organizations, women's organization, are are in uh, uh, they are placed best to collaborate with the international mechanisms to work together. And we need all your support uh, for that to happen. Thank you. Ms. Curry, if you can keep your answer short. Thank you. There, very, very short. Just that there is also the possibility without signing the Rome statute for the national unity government to do a self-referral under the ICC statute under Article 12. So they can just refer themselves, refer Burma themselves to the ICC. Great. Let me that. Yeah. We have already engaged with the ICC. We are, we are already in, engaged with the ICC. Let me go ahead and recognize a gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Levin, for the five minutes. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, I want to first say that I stand with Mr. Liu and other colleagues in that any a simple return to the status quo ante before the coup is not acceptable. Um, and I, I want to explore with you whether there is real hope of a new day between uh, the Bamar majority and the various ethnic major majority ethnic minorities, not just the Rohingya, but the Karin, Kachin, Mun, and others who make up 30% of the population of Burma all around the periphery. My first trip as a member of Congress was to Bangladesh, including Cox's Bazaar and the Rohingya refugee camps. I won't belabor the, the point of the horror of that, but you know, Ambassador Toon, we it is simply unacceptable that we are still where we are in talking about the lack of citizenship, the lack of safe return, and on and on. But my question is, with Rohingya and others, I've seen increasing reports about dialogue between different minority groups uh, and hope for a different future. You know, Burma was basically a state created that's a child of colonialism. Uh, you know, a state whose boundaries were kind of imposed by European powers. It's never cohered yet to this day as an inclusive democracy. And Ms. Omar, you know, I'm a scholar of Buddhism. I was supposed to get a PhD and be a professor of Asian religions, but I realized I should come and hang out with you all instead and talk about policy. So um, I'm not shy to say that the Burmese majority, the Buddhist majority has been unable to see the humanity and the citizenship of others. 
I feel like you might be a leader in this regard. Do, is there new hope in this horrible moment of repression from the Tatmada in a different future for Burma? And how can we get there? Um, I think that the question is directed to me, is it? Sorry, yes, I'm yes, sorry. Yes, yes. Yes. Um, uh, with, uh, in the past three months, I see, I see a ray of hope um, because I see the uh, different uh, ethnic communities coming together, while I also see, uh, particularly from the Buddhist uh, Burma majority, uh, showing their sympathy and uh, understanding and empathy to the other ethnic communities, such as like, you know, Karen and Kachin, who face the that kind, this kind of uh, abhorrent violence from the military for many generations. They are yes. publicly writing on their social media, and also uh, they are publicly apologizing to the ethnic communities, and including to the Rohingya people. Even uh, Congressman, I received the public apology uh, to my direct messages or like writing uh, for like they have assaulted and threatened and harassed me for my support and standing for the Rohingya people. So, so this, I see, uh, So yes. let me just ask, I'm so glad to hear that, but with this unity government obviously isn't the big vehicle here, what, what can we do as the Congress and as the United States to support authentic, bottom-up dialogue and, you know, um, democracy building amongst the the Bama majority and and the different minority groups. And I, you know, Ambassador Curry as well, or if you have more to say about that, um, Ms. Omar. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I would say that, first of all, we Burma never had a chance to uh, process a nation building. But with this uh, current moment, this is the the best chance and the best time, I mean, the first time that I've ever seen the opening opportunity. I would like for you to help and facilitate and support us by bringing these communities together. And in that, what we really need is like, you know, I, I, I look into the, the, the NUG, uh, there is a potential because within the NUG, there are different ministers who already uh, has taken the stand on the uh, universality, of human, universality of human rights as well as like supporting the Rohingya community as well. So we need to encourage these uh, elements within the NUG to be able to go up to the level of holding such dialogues among the different communities and with your support. Of course, you know, like uh, we, will, we will have to hold the NUG accountable for the human rights. We will have to hold the NUG accountable for the, uh, the, for the Rohingya people as well. Make sure that Rohingya people are also included in the process of the NUG and the leadership. But at the same time, NUG needs your support to be able to get to that point. So I think this is our proposal to the United States government is support the NUG, but make sure that we all, we all hold the NUG uh, to account for what they have to stand on the, the principles of human rights and as well as the protection of the ethnic and religious minorities, particularly the Rohingya people, that they, as they are the most uh, persecuted. Thank you very much. Well, I guess my time's expired, <laughs> Mr. Chairman, so I better yield back. Thank you. Beautiful statement. We'll, we're, I, we'll, we'll be here to support that dialogue one way or another, whatever is most appropriate. Thanks. Okay, thank, thank you. Let me go ahead and recognize the gentlelady from Pennsylvania, Ms. Hulahan. Hi, and thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you so much to you, everybody, for your really thoughtful conversation. I have also had the opportunity to go to Burma more than once, and it's a beautiful country, uh, and I'm uh, definitely devastated by what's happening there. I am fortunate enough that I'm on uh, the Foreign Affairs Committee, but specifically on the Asia Subcommittee and another one that's new that's called the Foreign Affairs Committee on International Development, International Organizations, and Global Social Impact, Global Corporate Social Impact, importantly. And so I was hoping that I might ask uh, both ambassadors if they could speak a little bit about the role that the U.S. and our allies' businesses, uh, for-profit businesses, could have if we stayed or in country rather than imposing sanctions. And I'm not specifically talking about, you know, oil, gas, those kinds of, um, you know, means or baddies that we've all been talking about, but I'm talking about other businesses that may uh, be helping or not negatively impacting the Burmese people themselves and allowing them to continue to have uh, potentially jobs uh, and otherwise. So if maybe I could start with um, Ambassador uh, Toon to ask if there's any value at all to maintaining some aspect of our businesses and our allies' businesses in Burma. Uh, thank, thank you, Ms. Kulahan. 
uh, I think it's very difficult. You know, it's uh, if we keep the you know the 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 business as usual, then it will benefit to the military. So my uh, my my short answer is that don't do it any business under this military. So that uh, that is what we 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 need to change their behavior. So if we go like this, definitely they will be surviving. So we need to stop them. Thank you. Uh, and uh, and Ambassador Curry, would you Curry, would you be able to uh, add to that? Is it your opinion that no business at all, all business being barred from the U.S. and our allies, would be the best course of action? I think that the key is to avoid doing business with the military junta. Sorry, my dog just started barking. I don't know if you can hear her. <laughs> um, but the perils of working at home. Um, but I think the key is to avoid working with the junta, avoid dealing with military-owned businesses as well as the crony businesses that support the military. Unfortunately, right now, due to the, um, the situation and basically the economic collapse of the, country, of the country under the civil disobedience movement and the work stoppages that are going on, there's not a whole lot of economic activity taking place. What we do need to do is try to find those mechanisms. There are projects that do work on small scale um, income generation for um, uh, IDP women, for instance, those activities can continue to and should, we should continue to lean into that sort of thing. But that's not what's going to, that's, that's incredibly different from the Chevron investment and the Yadana pipeline. I'm thinking about things like Turquoise Mountains work with Rakhine IDP weavers on in peri-urban areas of Yangon to produce woven fabrics for um, that that then get sold into into high end um, in, as high but end. Not all of those are like NGO that. driven. Some of those are 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 actually they are they are joint public private partnerships. And right. So I think that right now, if we can look primarily in areas where there are joint public private partnerships available and where we can ensure that companies are engaging either whether in their if they're in extractive industries they need to be strictly adhering to EITI standards if they're not in extractive industries they need to have very high awareness around who their partners are on the ground that's the key is being able to know your partner and being able to to have confidence that they are not feeding into the military um, and also you know looking at things like tax revenue and where your tax revenue is going yeah, exactly. I my, my next question, my last question is in a similar kind of should we stay or should we go line, uh, which is in light of the coup and the very clear uncertainty of the future and when, if and at any point, this will all clear up, what should the U.S. assistance to Burma look like in the near term? What should it look like uh, as we move forward? And I would love to know uh, from Ambassador Curry and Ms. Omar uh, if you would mind answering that question for me. So I'll very quickly reiterate, in the past, the United States was able to push assistance into Burma through parallel channels and through, um, through cross-border channels that avoided the military and military-run enterprises and ministries. We can go back to that model, and we've seen this happen in other countries and other contexts where the government's um, not trusted or capable. Uh, and Ms. Omar? And Ms. Omar, thanks. Um, I will um, second Ambassador Kelly as well. I think uh, what we really need is the assistance to be able to reach to all the most vulnerable and needy communities across the country uh, in light of the coup. This is where the situation is. So we will also need, like I said in the earlier, uh, we need uh, your uh, support and your um, uh, engagement with the Thai government, for example, to help uh, to, to for the Thai government to agree to open the uh, humanitarian aid corridors along the border areas. That goes to the Indian government as well. So if you could help us do that, then we will be able to save a lot of lives uh, by all kinds of means. And our civil society is very resilient and also very vibrant with so much capacity among the uh, also the among the uh, ethnic community. So we will appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. Thank you. Let, let me go ahead and recognize the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Malinowski. Thank you uh, so much, Mr. Barra. Hello to uh, all of our uh, all of our witnesses. I, I, I want to just start actually by by saying a few words. Uh, I have I have good.
good friends on this panel, but particularly to uh, to Ms. Omar. You, you, members of the committee heard a little bit about her story, how she was uh, a refugee from the 1988 uh, protest movement against the military government. Um, you all should know that she was actually one of the first, I think, three or four Burmese refugees to come to the United States at that time. And, and I know because I, I, I was there uh, and uh, and knew, knew her as uh, a slightly younger woman, um, college student at, at Simons Rock College up in upstate New York. And, and I, I saw you grow from, from those young, uh, confusing days into a leader. And, um, and a leader in what turned out to be a multi-decade struggle to return democracy to Burma. Um, you mentioned you testified to Congress uh, uh, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, uh, making very similar points as you are today about the Burmese military. And you know, I, I worry a little bit that you may feel that it was all in vain, that you're right back where you started. And I just want to tell you that that is not the case. Um, thanks to you and, and your generation, Burma does have a civil society now. It had 10 years of not true democracy, but relative freedom, during which people had a chance to begin to have these kinds of conversations. Thanks to you and, and your generation, there is a younger generation in Burma now who that really understands what it means to exercise the responsibilities of democratic citizenship. And we've heard in this hearing just how extraordinary this movement is. It's completely different from uh, what we saw in past Burmese democratic uprisings and its sophistication, its level of organization, its determination, its skill. Um, and that is the product of the work that you and many others did over the years. Um, I believe the military has much less legitimacy today. Back in the 1990s, when we were working on this for the first time, all the nations of Asia basically dealt with the military junta as the government of Burma that had always been the government of Burma. Um, that's a little bit different right now. You know, we, we heard from Ambassador John Moton today, um, and everyone should remember, he is speaking to us as the permanent representative of the country of Burma to the United Nations recognized by the United Nations. He's not speaking for some exiled government or some non-governmental group. He is the recognized representative of his country. And, and that complicates matters for the Burmese military junta in a very, very serious way. And I also think that although the US has always been on the side of the Burmese people, this is now a much higher priority for the United States government than it ever has been. I, I, I think the Biden's administration's uh, response there's more that can be done, and we've heard great ideas here, but I think it has been exemplary in, in the first two or three months of this administration from the freezing of over a billion dollars of funds uh, held by this junta in, uh, in the American financial system to, I think, a very sophisticated sanctions policy um, that we've seen unfold, and I expect more to come. So you should feel a sense of accomplishment as terrible as the situation is today. A couple of quick questions. Um, Ambassador Curry, you gave us a really uh, uh, interesting and I think uh, insightful assessment of, the, of China's complicated role, uh, more complicated than some might imagine uh, based on just the fact that China ideologically is not gonna be in favor of democracy in Burma. Uh, we've heard a little bit less uh, in this hearing about Russia, which seems to me actually at the United Nations to be a much more unvarnished uh, supporter of the Burmese junta. There is a military to military relationship. Could you say a little bit more about that? Sure, Russia is primarily the arms dealer for the Tamada and they have no bones about it. And they, as you said, have been more unvarnished in their willingness to accept the coup that just as they were, you know, just as they are unvarnished in their support for Assad in Syria, they, are completely amoral about all of this and they they don't care they don't care about democracy and they certainly don't care about any of that of the human rights considerations here they will they they like their client um that said if they are um if they lose china in resistance to u.n security council action i find it hard to see them acting alone on this this isn't syria they don't have as much strategic um, input in Burma, it's much more transactional for them and just an opportunity to be chaos agents, in my opinion. 
And I think that if they can move China to abstain, then Russia will follow them. Great. Thank you so much. I yield back. Great. Thank you. Um, I see Ms. Manning's camera, but I don't see Ms. Manning. So let's go to the gentleman from California, Mr. Vargas, and then we'll come back to Ms. Manning. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I want to thank the committee for holding this hearing and especially the witnesses today. Um, since I guess I'm not last, but almost last, I've, I've been privileged to hear most of the discussion here and many of the questions. I, I do have one question that I, I thought Mr. Uh, Malinowski was going to follow up on. That is China. Um, and I, we have heard quite a bit about it, but I, I'm, I'm surprised that they're not meddling more in this situation. Uh, not only because obviously it's on the border, but as uh, Mr. Wilson uh, very appropriately and proudly mentioned, you know, his father was a flying tiger. The United States has a very long history with Burma, a very proud history. And that's why I would think that the Chinese would want to meddle more in the situation in Myanmar, but they haven't. What, why is that? Uh, Ambassador Curry, why don't you handle that one? Well, I think, to, I think they're meddling a lot, actually. I think they're trying to, to shore up their own interests, which is what they do best in these situations from their own perspective. But their interests are very narrowly cast, and, and, and so they are doing things that are not helping them. And when they have taken an action in one way or the other, it has set off protests against them and put them in uncomfortable positions. I think they are in an uncomfortable position, and they're not quite sure what to do because this has gone on and, and has unfolded in a way that they're not really comfortable with. I think the thing that makes them probably most uncomfortable is the way that the protesters in Burma have linked up with protesters across the region, several of whom also are uh, agitating against the Chinese, whether it's on, uh, the Chinese Communist Party, whether it's the ones in Taiwan or the, the protesters in Hong Kong as part of the Milk Tea Alliance. So I think that has really got them off balance. I think they frankly are a little off balance. They've resorted to their usual tools, but they aren't working very well. But but I, I guess I would ask that or, or comment that the Chinese oftentimes are uncomfortable and they seem to act anyway. And I see them with their belt and road acting in places where it's uncomfortable, but they continue to act. And uh, that's why the off balance sort of catches me off balance. I, I don't understand why they aren't more active here. I mean, it's right on their, obviously it's on their border. Um, you would think that they'd be much more engaged. Their preference is to see what happens and then deal with whoever comes out on top. And because nobody is on top right now and there's not a clear outcome, I think that they are continuing to hold back. And by keeping things like Security Council deliberations private and not holding them in the public, I more, we're allowing them space to continue to hold back and withhold until and, and not have to put their chips on a number that they can kind of keep their cards close to the best. I'm sorry, I'm mixing gambling metaphors. That's okay. But but I don't I don't understand why they don't want to force or influence who comes out on top. I mean you you mentioned they're gonna sit back and wait. You would think that they would be more involved in pushing to see who does come out on top. I think they're outcome neutral here, actually. Mm -hmm. I mean, they just want an outcome. That's that's what they want. They want okay. somebody to deal with that they can make deals with. And they don't okay. really care who it is because they've found over the past five years that they can deal with the NLD just fine. They have no problem manipulating the NLD and cutting deals with them. It worked out great for them the past five years. In fact, better than dealing with the junta because they had more legitimacy because they were dealing with a more legitimate government. So they would rather just wait and see and not be forced to make a choice. That's their preference. Okay. I uh, heard today and I've read, of course, about the potential 2 million people that have food insecurity. I have to tell you, I have every faith in the United Nations World Food Program, and in particular, the leader there, the new leader that they've had for a few years, David Beasley. I, I always tell him if he was Catholic, we'd make him a saint. But I think he's done great things around the world. He's worked very hard. And, um, and, and again, how can we help and how can the United Nations World Food Program help more? Maybe tie it in with what we should do uh, helping the um, people with Taiwan, because I know Taiwan also has uh, obviously a lot of opportunity to help and hasn't really done much. Senator Curry. 
I, I mean, Senator Curry, Ambassador Curry. Well, thanks, thanks for the promotion, but I'll, I'll stick with Ambassador Curry. I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm sure it is. All right. I'm a house girl. I work on the house side, so I, I hear you. Okay. Um, I, I would say that, you know, the WFP does do amazing work, and David Beasley is a wonderful leader there. Um, but I think that the key is to give the UN agencies the flexibility to do more cross-border. Again, I, I, I'm a, like a one-trick pony here. Cross-border, 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 parallel system. Allow them, you know, encourage and allow them to go around the blockages with the government um, or with the, I'm sorry, with the, with the junta that, that would keep the assistance from getting directly to the people who need it and the most vulnerable people in the country. Okay, uh, thank you very much. I have 23 seconds left, so I won't force a question upon anyone that, uh, I just again want to thank everyone for being here, appreciate it, and, and hopefully we can be more involved, but it's also a little tricky for us too because we do believe in the, in the human rights aspect so deeply, and it's troubling the former government. But anyway, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Great, thank you, and I still see Ms. Manning's camera, but don't see Representative Manning, so let me go over to um, recognize a gentleman from Illinois, um, Representative Schneider, and I'll be passing the gavel off to the Vice Chair of the Full Committee, uh, Mr. Malinowski. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairman Barra and, and uh, Vice Chairman Malinowski, and I want to thank all the witnesses for sharing your perspectives today. Um, so uh, it's, it's, it's good to be here and uh, have what may, what may not be the, the, the final question. Um, but, the, you know, Speaking of perspectives, one of the things uh, that has always struck me, I like looking at maps in, in, in different ways. And if you look at the map of, of the Indian Ocean as the center of the map rather than the Atlantic Ocean, it's very clear to see the importance of from the wedge between China and India. It's uh, you know the, the Indian Ocean, it's Africa, it's the Middle East, it's the Indian subcontinent, it's Australia and Indonesia. Um, it's a rather important area. And a lot of people have interest. I know we talked about those um, today. And maybe Ambassador Curry, I'll, I'll start with you. But you know, we talked about China and Russia and, and India and their respective interests. But these interests intersect with each other and, and there's an interplay. And, and how does that affect the decision making we should uh, be doing in Congress and as the United States? Well, I'll affirm as neighbors, as well as uh, countries that have an interest in it, including Japan, the United States, you know, we are all pursuing our own interests in, in Burma, and that's to be expected. I think that we also have to account for the agency of the Burmese people here, that they're not just a pawn in our great game. They have agency, and in the past, past Burmese governments have proven very good and very resilient at managing great power competition. Um, in, uh, uh, over and around their interests and playing powers off of each other, whether it's the U.S. and China or India or ASEAN. They are quite good at manipulating, um, uh, and, and the military junta in particular, because they don't care about the people of the country, except as they represent a resource for them to exploit. So they're perfectly willing to sacrifice the well-being of their own people um, in order to gain leverage with, with others, including um, the United States and other parties. So I think that we have to be mindful that this, you know, like other places is a, is a complicated situation. And while we're pursuing our interests in this context, we have to be mindful that there, there are interests, that there are agency, people with agency on the ground, that this is not a tabula rasa blank slate, that nothing's going on there. And we can't just shape the events of this country to our will. Um, so I think that's the first step is to really have a very kind of humble. And then to the extent that we can align our interests and our policies with what the desires and the clear desires of the people of the country are, we're long term going to be better off. And we saw this that even after country, people in the country were quite angry with the United States or critical or unhappy when we took the side, when we spoke out in favor of the Rohingya or to defend the Rohingya or criticize um, what had happened during the Rohingya genocide, there was still a very strong reservoir of support for the United States that underlied this momentary, you know, irrit popular irritation. And so I think that there's still a strong desire um, for these things, for alignment with the United States and for what the, the kinds of values and that we represent. 
that we have an enduring appeal um, in Burma that we can rely on, uh, even though we're not a neighbor and can't rely on the, the strategic reserves that the Chinese or the Indians necessarily have. Well, thanks, Sharon. And if I can turn to the permanent representative and, and thank you for uh, being with, with us here today. Uh, you're, I imagine, having conversations with uh, the respective representatives from China and Russia at the UN. Um, could you share a little bit about those conversations and how it might inform again the, the decisions we're trying to make here in the U.S. Congress? Thank you, thank you, Mr. Shanaida. Uh, so it's it's not uh, lately, but uh, the, before like three four weeks ago, I when I talked to the Chinese uh, uh, permanent representative, uh, and he because they are worried about the you know the perception of the people vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis China because the perception uh, uh, of people towards China is very negative, so that that is that, that what they they worry. Because you know, uh, I, I the perception that because in the people eyes, uh, the China is always with the, the military, but China said that they are not with the military. They uh, they they like to see their country like stable and the prospered uh, Myanmar. But I, what I I would stress is that you know very this is very important time for China to demonstrate they are with the people of Myanmar, not with the uh, with the military. How they can show it? They can, you know, uh, 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 they condemn the military coup, uh, uh, they condemn the the violence act, uh, the the uh, demand the release of you know the, the all the lawful detainees, in, including leaders, and then to stop you know doing business with the military. That's sort of the point that I I I I, I express. But the the point that they always make is that they don't want to get misunderstood from the people of Myanmar because they like to sh uh, show that they are with the people of Myanmar. But uh, the pe in the eyes of people of Myanmar, it's still very difficult. Thank uh, you. Thank you. And, and Ms. Omar, I'm sorry we're out of time. Um, I, I would love to hear your perspective as well. But with that, I will yield back. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. And I see Representative Manning is is back. And I will yield five minutes to uh, to her. And then we'll close. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you to the witnesses for, for all your testimony and ask, uh, answering so many questions on this very difficult topic. Uh, Ambassador Curry, women continue to risk their lives and play central roles in nonviolence to bring about a true democracy in Burma, even as the Burmese military uses uh, sexual and gender-based violence as a weapon of war. How can we best support women in the movement at this time? Um, the United States has a long history going back to the founding of the Women's League of Burma, where I and I was proud to be there with Ma Omar uh, at the first conference of the Women's League of Burma, quietly sitting in a corner crying, watching this amazing event <laughs> unfold. <laughs> it was so beautiful to see. And to see the generations that have followed and how they've stepped up in this movement has been tremendous. At the same time, the dark side of it is the stories that I hear, the messages I get about young women taking Plan B birth control pills with them when they go out to protest because they fear being raped by the military. You know, just these heartbreaking stories of sexual assault and abuse and sexual violence because this is a you know pathology that is highly present within the Tatmada. And I think that the key is to work with the UN agencies that actually do work. There are a few parts of the UN that actually function well. One is the office of um, Carmelo Patton, who's the, the, um, the SG's special representative on sexual violence and armed conflict. And she is fantastic and does amazing work. She has an MOU with the government on this issue. Um, that came out of the Rohingya crisis, but can now be more broadly applied. And to also continue to support the investigative mechanisms and the other um, accountability mechanisms and make sure that we're holding people accountable and that we are sanctioning individuals who are involved in sexual violence when we get information about that. I think that that's a critical thing that we can do. We've done that in other contexts where we've specifically sanctioned in South Sudan, for instance, individuals for um, sexual violence. Thank you. Uh, some of those details are just horrific, but thank you for those, for, the, for your answer. Ms. Omar, 
Uh, and thank you for being with us today. What, what more can the U.S. and the international community do to ensure the basic human rights of refugees are protected in neighboring countries throughout what is what is very likely to be a protect, protracted displacement? And, and what are some of your concerns with respect to the treatment of refugees in, in the border regions? Thank you very much for your question, uh, Madam Congresswoman. Um, the, the very need that at the moment is, uh, as I was also mentioning earlier, we really need the Thai government to open their, uh, their, uh, their um, border, but also allow the humanitarian agencies to operate. Uh, because right now, I mean, the, 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 the Thailand government has already set, uh, you know, like a best examples uh, in the previous times for the people fleeing from Burma. And I think we need to get their support again. And I, I really hope that the U.S. government and also the Congress will actually uh, ex convince the Thai government that they are this is also they are in their best interest to uh, protect the people of Burma as well as also you know, like uh, to show their humanity side of the the the, like the the country because Thai civil society has always been supporting our people. And Thai government in the past has always been supporting too, but only now that we are having some difficult time. So if you could actually uh, get the Thai government on board uh, uh, for the humanitarian assistance uh, to the refugees, not only those who are fleeing right now, but also those who remain in the refugee camps who don't have a, you know, who are surviving in the very minimum uh, minimum needs at the moment. And we really need the cross-border aid because many people in the ethnic uh, uh, revolutionary con uh, control areas, they really need the support and only through the human, the cross-border that we will be able to help them and get the, uh, the, the, the needs uh, reached to them. So thank you very much. If you could take that, yeah. Thank you. Let me ask one last quick question. Do you expect that this COVID-19 pandemic will add a, a complicating factor to get the, the Thai people to assist? Um, uh, this is one of the very worry locally, uh, definitely, but also this is also, I think this is also uh, COVID-19 can be the uh, entry point for the local Thai society, uh, Thai communities to feed confidence if the U.S. will, for example, like support the Thai government with the COVID-19 vaccines, for example, and they need it so much, they need it so much, they are very worried of are uh, not willing to open the, the door to the Myanmar people, Burma people leaving is because they worry about their own situation. So if you will actually uh, support to the Thai government with the COVID-19 vaccines and other uh, necessary, like including the, like, you know, like uh, including the quarantine uh, testing and monitoring and all of those um, other necessary elements of what is need to be uh, uh, for the uh, COVID-19 uh, situation. I think there is a very uh, good chance that the U.S., I mean, sorry, the Thai communities will come back to welcome the Burma people. Well, also, I think the Thai government will also come back to take the, take the, 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 the take back the, you know, the people like they have done all, all along in the past. Thank you. Thanks so much. My time has expired. I yield back. Thank you so much, uh, Representative Manning, uh, and to all of our members. Uh, and, and of course, most of all, to our distinguished witnesses, uh, Ambassador Jean Mot uh, uh, Motun, um, Ambassador Kelly Curry, and, uh, and our, our friend, Ms. Kin Omar. Uh, I know the chairman would, uh, would also uh, want me to recognize our, our friend and uh, colleague, uh, the ranking member of the committee, uh, Mr. McCall, for his partnership in, in helping to put this hearing together um, and in all of our bipartisan work uh, together uh, on the Foreign Affairs Committee. Uh, the situation in Burma is going to demand uh, America's attention and this committee's attention for some time to come. This is not a challenge that the United States can meet alone, but I think it's important for all of us to remember that the United States has a unique historical relationship with Burma and with the people of Burma, having led the international effort for decades to bring Burma closer to democracy. Um, we can't do it alone, but there is uh, there is about zero chance that 
uh, ASEAN or the United Nations or our allies in Europe or any other international body or institution would be doing the things that they are doing right now to help the Burmese people, if not for intensive American engagement and, and leadership uh, today and, and in the many years that have preceded this moment. Um, that's gonna demand continued oversight uh, for this, uh, from this committee as we figure out the best ways, the most effective ways to stand with the Burmese people um, and uh, recognizing as well that how we respond to the crisis of democracy in Burma is going to be a test of how the United States responds to the crisis of democracy throughout the world, a test that we absolutely have to pass here and more broadly. So with that, thank you once again uh, to all of the members, to our distinguished witnesses, and this hearing is now adjourned. Striking the gavel.